I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Good afternoon and happy Monday. It's 3 p.m. Welcome to the Martin Dalby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up in today's show, the growing pressure on the Prime Minister. We have an exclusive interview with Rishi Sunak, who's faced a tough grilling from our political editor on a crunch week ahead. It includes a, a potential rebellion from within his own party over his flagship Rwanda bill. Some MPs say it doesn't go far enough and will vote against it in the Commons later this week. Plus, there's criticism of how he gave the green light for military strikes against Houthis in the Middle East without consulting Parliament. The Prime Minister will be giving a statement in the Commons this hour and we'll cross that live. And in other news, the damning report which found that girls were left at the mercy of paedophile grooming gangs for years in Rochdale because of failings by senior police and council bosses. And that's all coming up in this next Action Packed Hour. And we're just hearing reports in the last hour of a ship near Yemen being hit by a missile strike. More details to follow on that dramatic story. As usual, I want to hear from you. Please email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. And that's all the latest. Get that over to us. Let us know what you think. Is it toast for Rishi this week? This is a huge, huge week for Rishi Sunak, and we'll be right all over it. Now it's time for your latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon. It's one minute past three. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. 
The UK's maritime organization is warning vessels to sail with caution after reports of another attack on a ship southeast of Yemen's port of Aden. It's being reported the attack caused fire, but no one on board was injured. This latest attack is the second since the US and UK joint strikes on Houthi rebels. It's understood the vessel is US-owned. We're expecting Rishi Sunak to speak in the Commons later this hour about the strikes across Yemen. We'll bring that to you live here on GB News. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister says he'll overrule European human rights judges if they try to stop UK sending migrants to Rwanda. That says dozens of Conservative MPs call for the Rwanda bill to be toughened in a bid to deter people from making the dangerous journey in small boats across the Channel. Speaking exclusively to GB News, Rishi Sunak insists tackling illegal migration is the compassionate thing to do. Your heart breaks when you hear these stories about people dying. They're being exploited by criminal gangs, and that's why we've got to resolve this issue. There's lots of reasons why, and we should talk about them, but one of them is that innocent people are being exploited by criminal gangs. That's not right. There's nothing compassionate about it, and in fact, the compassionate thing to do is to tackle illegal migration, and that's what our Rwanda scheme will do. I've been Prime Minister for a year, just over, and in that time, we've actually reduced the number of people coming here by over a third. That hasn't happened before. No one else has managed to achieve that. The Prime Minister's comments come after it was revealed that more than 200 migrants crossed the English Channel in small boats at the weekend. That's despite the poor weather conditions. Five people died on the French side of the Channel yesterday after getting into difficulties just off the coast near Boulogne. Girls were left at the mercy of a paedophile grooming gangs due to failings by senior police and council leaders. That's according to a comprehensive new report covering nearly 10 years of failed investigations by Greater Manchester Police. It's highlighted years of widespread organised sexual abuse of children in the Rochdale area, despite what it described as compelling evidence reported to authorities as early as 2004. Greater Manchester Police Chief Constable Stephen Watson says the report paints a damning picture. The findings evidenced within it are shocking, stark and shameful. It speaks to the systemic failure of various agencies to pull together and do the obvious and the right thing. And above all, it outlines in painful detail all of those missed opportunities where decisive action could and should have been taken. Two Palestinians have carried out coordinated car rammings in central Israel, killing a woman and injuring at least 12 others. Images from the scene of one of the attacks in Ranana, near Tel Aviv, show several damaged vehicles as emergency services attend to multiple injuries. Police described the incident as a terrorist attack and said two suspects are under arrest. There's not yet been any claim of responsibility. The UK will send 20,000 troops across Europe in what's been called a vital reassurance against the Putin menace. It'll include deployments from the Army, the Navy and the RAF, making it the largest NATO exercise since the Cold War. The drill involves 31 nations, with the Defence Secretary saying troops will be prepared for invasion of a NATO member state by any aggressor. Commuters are in for a fresh series of delays as the Aslef Union announces more strike action. Drivers will take part in a rolling programme of one-day walkouts from the end of the month, including a ban on overtime. The union says it's aiming to put pressure on what it describes as a tone-deaf Tory government, calling for drivers to get their first pay rise in five years. Junior doctors in Wales are staging a three-day walkout over pay. It'll last until Thursday morning, with around 3,000 doctors walking off the job. The Welsh Government says the impact on services will be significant, but insists urgent care will continue. The Doctors' Trade Union says pay has been eroded by almost a third since 2008. And a volcano that erupted yesterday in Iceland is sending lava flowing into nearby villages, covering houses. These are live pictures coming to us from Grindavik, where a volcano is still bursting with lava as smoke billows into the sky. It's the second eruption in the country's southwest in less than a month. Iceland's Prime Minister is warning residents to take care. This is GB News across the UK on TV and on your smart speaker by playing GB News. Now it's back to Martin.
Thank you, Sophia. Now, welcome to today's show. Dominating today's programme, of course, will be the growing pressure the Prime Minister is coming under for his flagship Rwanda policy and his decision to take military action on Houthis in the Middle East. Rishi Sunak visited Lee on sea in Essex this morning and played down polling, suggesting that the Tories could be on course for a 1997-style electoral wipeout at the next general election. I'm going to discuss that shortly with our political editor. I'm also joined in the studio by Jonathan Gullis, Tory MP for Stoke-on-Trent, for his full reaction. But first, let's cross to our political editor, Chris Hope. He managed to get this exclusive interview with the Prime Minister on the huge challenges he faces this week. Prime Minister, thank you for joining us today on GB News. Five people died this weekend trying to cross the, to the UK. Will your Rwanda bill stop the deaths? Yeah, it's, it's a, another tragic example of what this illegal trade is doing to innocent people. And, you know, my, you know, your heart breaks when you hear these stories about people dying. They're being exploited by criminal gangs, and that's why we've got to resolve this issue. There's lots of reasons why, and we should talk about them, but one of them is that innocent people are being exploited by criminal gangs. That's not right. There's nothing compassionate about it, and, in fact, the compassionate thing to do is to tackle illegal migration, and that's what our Rwanda scheme will do. But that's just one of the reasons why it's important that we resolve this issue, because fundamentally illegal migration just isn't fair. You know, we're a country where we play by the rules. We put in our fair share. We wait our turn. And illegal migration undermines that sense of fairness, which I think is fundamental to our national character and, and the trust on which our system is built. And it's for that reason, especially, that we really must tackle illegal migration. That's why I made it one of my five priorities, and I'm determined to do what it takes to, to fix it. Our viewers at GB News are very exercised by it, as you might imagine. David is emailed in to say that the plan is political sleight of hand to give an illusion of activity to appease voters. And Andy, another uh, viewer, he says the Rwanda policy is a complete waste of time. It won't work, it won't deter. City of your own MPs, including his fellow Braveman and your friend Robert Jenrick, also don't think currently drafted it works. Are they right? Well, look, I, to all those questions, I'd say, well, let's look at the track record first, right? I've been Prime Minister for a year, just over, and in that time we've actually reduced the number of people coming here by over a third. That hasn't happened before. No one else has managed to achieve that. That's because we've done lots of good work to tackle this issue because I care about it and I've, I've put a lot of effort into doing something about it. So that should give people a sense of my seriousness of purpose about tackling illegal migration, the fact that it's down for the first time as a result of all that activities. And, and look, will it, will it work? Yeah, I believe deterrence does work. Uh, and the reason I have confidence in that is because of our Albania programme. After I became Prime Minister, I negotiated a new deal with Albania, which means we can now return and did return thousands and thousands of illegal migrants back to Albania last year. And you know what? The numbers coming from Albania dropped by over 90%. Right? That shows that this deterrence works. If people come here illegally but know that they can't stay and that they will be returned, you know what? They stop coming, especially when they're paying people thousands of pounds to facilitate the crossing. No point in doing that if they're not going to end up staying. So, look, I do believe deterrence works. Our, our programme with Albania shows that it works, and that's why it's important that we get Rwanda up and running. That's the better long-term solution to fixing this problem once and for all. You said last week in Accrington you wanted bright ideas that could improve the bill. Have you seen any yet? Are any of the ideas put down by the right of the party bright ideas? Will you accept them? No, I've always said that I'm happy to have a dialogue with anyone who thinks they might have an idea that will improve the effectiveness of the bill whilst making sure that it's still legally compliant, maintains Rwanda's participation in the scheme. Obviously important. We might have all the ideas you want, but ultimately if that means Rwanda will stop participating in the scheme, that's no good at all because a policy without anyone anywhere to send people to isn't a policy that's going to do anyone any good. Um, and look, I'm happy to have that dialogue. I'm, no, I'm confident that the bill that we've put forward will work. It's also the toughest piece of migration legislation that anyone's ever seen. It goes further than anyone previously was prepared to go. And if you look at it very practically, it systematically shuts off all the avenues of claim that people have tried to make before. Asylum, blocked. Modern slavery, blocked. Rwanda isn't safe, blocked. The fact that you'll be sent somewhere from Rwanda, 
blocked. Human rights, spurious human rights claims, they've been disapplied. So if you go through these things systematically, uh, it, all these check challenges have been blocked. And that's why leading Supreme, former Supreme Court judges, leading lawyers have all said that they think the bill will do the job that it needs to do. So on that very point then, would you overrule European judges trying to stop flights taking off, so-called Rule 39 orders? Now, I've been very clear I won't let a foreign court stop us from getting flights off and this deterrent working. Now, there's a clause in the bill that says very specifically that it is for ministers to decide whether to comply what with these Rule 39 uh, uh, rulings uh, as their court. I would not have put that clause in the bill if I was not prepared to use it. Now, look, I, I don't think Strasbourg will intervene because of the checks and balances in our system. And, of course, there will be individual circumstances that people will want us to consider on the facts. Uh, but if you're asking me, you know, are there circumstances in which I'm prepared to ignore those Rule 39s, then, yes, of course there are. Why have your party failed to control legal or illegal migration since 2010? Look, all I can tell you is the track record that I've got over the last, uh, over the last period as Prime Minister. The numbers, first of all, are far too high. Right? I'm, not, I'm not in any way going to say anything other than that. The numbers of legal migration in this country are too high. They're putting unsustainable pressure on our public services, on local communities. That's not right. I supported Brexit. Many of your viewers supported Brexit, but partly because they wanted us to control legal migration. Now, I'm determined to make sure that we do that and bring the numbers down. We've announced a series of measures that will tackle it. They will reduce the numbers by hundreds of thousands, tackling student dependence, social care visa, which has been exploited, and raising the amount of money that people need to earn if they're going to migrate here so that we don't undercut British workers. No one has done anything like that before. They will reduce the numbers by around 300,000 and bring it back down to sustainable levels. That's what I want to see. Uh, and as I said, those policies kicked in at the beginning of this year, so people will start to see them working over the course of this year. It is the problem that middle-class professional people benefit from cheap labour. I mean, do you personally get the anger felt in some red wall areas, certainly, about the numbers coming in? Yeah, I said the numbers are too high. Right? I, get, I, I, it, of course, I, I mean, I voted for Brexit. I supported Brexit, partly because I think it's important that we have control over legal migration. I say that as coming from a family of immigrants, right? This is about having a sustainable level of migration and making sure that we're also investing in jobs for people here at home. It's the flip side of this also, by the way, is why we're investing more in skills and reforming our welfare system, right? If we want more people to be doing jobs here so we're less reliant on foreign labour, we've got to be investing in skills, apprenticeships. That's what this government is doing, unlike the Labour Party that wants to halve the number of apprenticeships. But we're also reforming our welfare system, where there are far too many people People who are being classified as not fit to work. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair. I want to support those people into work because that's good for them and their families. There's dignity in work and we need to have a system that is sustainable. And if we do that, as we're doing, because we've seen a worrying rise over the past several years in the number of people, as I said, being signed off as sick. Now, we are going to reform that. Lots of people will criticise it, but it's the right thing to do for those people, for the country, but also it will help us be less reliant on foreign labour, which is something that we all want to see. Today's poll in the Telegraph from YouGov is dreadful news for your party. We're by the post here. The tide has gone out. Has it gone out for the Tory party? Look, look, there's lots of polls all the time. There'll be hundreds of polls between now and the election, but the only poll that counts is the one that actually happens at the general election. And look, the choice of that election is clear. Right? You can stick with our plan that is working, or you can go back to square one with Keir Starmer. Right? I, I firmly believe that look, the last year or so hasn't been easy, but we've turned the corner, the country's pointing in the right direction, and the progress that we are making is starting to deliver dividends for people. You can see that just last weekend, we cut taxes for everyone in work. That's, that's a tax cut worth £450 for someone earning £35,000. That shows that the progress we've made on the economy, halving inflation, is, is delivering dividends. The plan is working. The alternative is going back to square one with Keir Starmer. He's been leader of the opposition for four years. Not once has he said what he would do differently, and that's because he doesn't have a plan. He just snipes from the sidelines, and we know that they don't have a plan to fund their £28 billion borrowing spree. That just means taxes going up for people. He certainly doesn't have a plan to control our borders and stop the boats. He doesn't have a plan to control welfare. He can't tell you what he's going to say on any of these things. We're drinking a cup of GB News tea here on the coast in, in, in Essex. Do you worry that you're not everyone's cup of tea, you're, that your, your wealth, which is earned, means you can't relate to what ordinary people worry about? You know, I'd say a couple of things about that. You know, I, I never heard that during the pandemic when I was Chancellor. 
right? When I stood up and announced a furlough scheme, uh, no one said that then, right? Because I think fundamentally people judge you by the content of your character and your actions, and that's how people will judge me. And look, my family emigrated to this country without very much. You know, my parents worked really hard. For, to provide a better life for me and my brother and sister. I worked really hard for everything that I've got. That's the type of country I believe in. And if people want to use that as a you know, political smear or attack, I actually think it speaks volumes about their lack of ambition for our country than it does about me and my background. Mm. I just finally, did you wince when you see your tax bill? Excuse me? Do, do, you, do you wince when you see your tax bill? You talk, well, look, I want taxes to come down for everyone, and that's why I'm pleased that because we've halved inflation last year, because wages are now rising, we've managed to grip spending and borrowing and welfare, we're now able to cut people's taxes. So just the other weekend, a significant tax cut. Everyone in work, £450 on average for someone earning £35,000. I've said I want to cut taxes more when it's responsible to do so. We also had a massive tax cut for businesses that was announced, which hundreds of businesses described as the single most transformative thing we could do for growth and investment in our country. And look, that's my plan. That's our plan. We want to control spending and welfare and, and, and so that we can cut taxes. We are now delivering that. As I said, stick with the plan rather than go back to square one with Keir Starmer because that's just going to mean £28 billion of spending that he doesn't know how to pay for and higher taxes for everyone. Prime Minister, thank you for joining us on a freezing cold. Yeah, <laughs> we're keeping coast. warm with the GB News team. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thanks very much. <laughs> Well, another superb exclusive there from Christopher Hope, who's on a roll and is fighting them on the beaches. I'm going to cut to Chris in a moment. I'm also joined in the studio here by Jonathan Gullis, Tory MP for Stoke-on-Trent North, for his reaction. But first, let's go to Chris Hope, who joins me now. Chris, we will fight them on the beaches. A fantastic exclusive. On that point of the Rwanda revolt, Rishi didn't seem that nervous to me. He, sounds, he seems to have found his mojo. For a long time, Chris, people have been saying British law is sovereign. We can push back. It seems Rishi seems to have finally, perhaps, found his mojo on that topic, Chris. That's right, Martin. He's moved a bit, hasn't he, since uh, eight days ago when he was uh, on the, 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 in the, being interviewed there by Laura Koonsberg, the BBC's main political presenter, asked her him the same question. He wouldn't say that in terms. He said there very clearly, if you're asking me are the circumstances in which I'm prepared to ignore Rule 39 orders, orders from the European Court of Human Rights, these flights can't take off, he said, then of course there are. Now, that's gone a lot to go, and I think the reason why is he's facing um, Armageddon on th Wednesday night. He's got 60 Tory MPs supporting changes to harden up the Rwanda bill. Um, if he doesn't do that, he knows that if, if half of them vote against it, vote the bill down on Wednesday, the whole thing collapses and the policy is dead. Um, that's what he's facing. He's trying to avoid doing anything, do anything in writing because he's got to get that past the One Nation caucus reception events I went to, they were willing to support this bill unamended. The other risk he's got is Rwanda, the country itself where these deportation flights will be received. They made clear that if the bill goes too far, it will collapse the treaty agreed with that country. He's walking along a very, very narrow tightrope at the moment, and it's very difficult for him to do anything apart from say uh, words and mean them and make clear to rebels that he's being tough. Now, the, these rebels, the so-called five families of Tory MPs, um, they're meeting tonight, some of them, the Common Sense Group, the European uh, Research Group of Tory MPs, the New Conservatives, they're meeting today to work out what are the next steps. Um, as we know from that interview with Suella Braveman on Friday, one option is voting the whole thing down on Wednesday night. It's a very, very dangerous, precarious point in the PM's premiership. OK, Chris Hope, thanks for joining us live from Leon C. I'm joined now in the studio by Jonathan Gillis, Conservative MP for Stoke on Trent North. And Jonathan, something tells me you might be one of those rebels uh, that plans to try and get this legislation beefed up. But Rishi seems pretty confident there. They won't need to be beefed up. And he seems adamant that Strasbourg won't step up and stop the flights. Do you trust him on that? Well, look, I think it's important to remember, first of all, the government legal advice is that it is 50-50 about whether or not we'll even get a plane off before the general election. I don't like those odds. The British people certainly won't continue with those odds. So we need to make sure the odds are more in our favour, which is what our amendments are about to do. 
The other side of this is, of course, that the legal advice that the Prime Minister's had is that uh, the bill has holes in it in the sense of that individuals can actually still yeah. put in claims. So whilst we've declared Rwanda safe, we haven't stopped individuals being able to say that they think in their own circumstance they would be unsafe in Rwanda. And so one of our amendments, which will be debated tomorrow, is about how we can make it that you can only fight against your fitness to fly. So it would only be yeah. if you're heavily pregnant, if you're a minor, if you're receiving cancer treatment, that you wouldn't be put on a plane. Every civilised country in the world would think that was fair. On Wednesday, and this is the crucial one, Strasbourg, now we're mm -hmm. saying, the Prime Minister has made it clear, that it's the default position of this bill is that we have some reserve power that we might that we will use in circumstances that leaves me nervous because what are the circumstances when they will what are the circumstances when they won't ignore Strasbourg? Mm. We think it should be automatically the position that it's the default that we will ignore Strasbourg. These are all 39 pajama injunctions. We're never part of the convention, as you know, Martin, when we signed up in the 1950s. Yep. First used, I think, in 2005 against Turkey, if I'm not mistaken. They're not actually even bound in any law. Law Sumption, who the Prime Minister has used to quote quite often, has actually supported that viewpoint as well, uh, as well as many other noble uh, law lords and other, mm. uh, like Richard, Professor Richard Eakins, for example, as well. So I think it's... What we're trying to say is, if you're serious about ignoring foreign courts, then make that the automatic default position. And then, in extreme circumstances, you may choose to actually go with them, but make it the default to ignore them rather than have some reserve power, which we hope the civil service won't block and that the ministerial code won't block. Because let's not forget, it does say the ministerial code should not breach international law, which I think is bizarre because international law should not trump our sovereignty, our ability to control our borders well, or our laws. Well, it shouldn't, but it probably will if the lawyers get their, get their look. And I want to ask you as well about this poll out today, this 1997-style electoral wipeout. 120-seat majority, the Labour Party are destined to get according to this poll. Kingmakers or breakers in that, the reform party um, who are going to be the difference in a lot of seats including ministerial seats and big beasts could fall what do you make of reform what's your message to them well my message to reform is that I totally understand that they are picking up a lot of disillusioned conservatives people who feel that we haven't delivered for that radical reform that they voted for in 2019 and they also certainly voted for in 2016 in the general election but if you look at that poll in my own seat of Stoke-on-Trent North Kids Grove and Talk if you had the conservative and reform vote together Labour will not get in so the reality is that a vote for reform will allow a Labour MP, and my Labour opponent was tweeting on the day of the referendum that he's looking to London and praying to London to save him from Brexit. I and mean, he's meant to serve the people of Stoke-on-Trent and was saying that he was happy to pay money into the EU. These are tweets that he literally mm. put out there himself, which I think is quite astonishing. So for my simplicity is this, whilst I understand that reform want to hold the Conservatives' feet to the fire, whilst I understand they want the Conservative Party to be the Conservative Party, I am a Conservative MP on the Conservative wing of the Conservative Party, and that reform will take out MPs like me, they will leave the One Nation centrist globalists in play, and sadly, I don't think they'll, and as the poll shows, they'll end up with zero MPs themselves. So actually, they would have done the very worst thing by having Starmageddon, as Richard Tice has fairly called him, uh, with a disastrous woke agenda flip-flopping, you know, kind of policy-making. What about Nigel Tory well, I think Nigel Farage is certainly, I think, a big game changer. He is a big political beast. He's someone who communicates very effectively with the British public and someone who does speak for a broad electorate. I know in my own seat that he is held in, uh, with a high affection. But I think I would say to Nigel again that whilst I totally respect that he has every right to come on the field, if he comes onto the field to play, it will be Tory MPs like me that are no longer in Parliament he will also unlikely be in Parliament as well, and we'll both be screaming from the outside, where why not have someone like myself fighting from the inside too? OK, Jonathan Gunnis, Stoke-on-Trent North MP, thanks for joining us in the Westminster studio. Superb stuff. Now, coming up, some breaking news. There are reports of three missiles being launched at the US-owned bulk carrier in the Gulf of Aden. More details to follow. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels 
we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Welcome back. It's 3.28. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, the US military confirms Houthi rebels launched three missiles, with one hitting a US-owned ship in the Gulf of Aden near Yemen. And this comes as Defence Secretary Grant Shapps says he hopes that airstrikes launched by the UK and US last Thursday are a one-off and there will be no need for a campaign of missile attacks. Well, in the next hour, Prime Minister Richie Sunak will address the House of Commons about action taken in the Red Sea. But before that, joining me now is GB News' home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, thanks for joining us. So the airstrikes in Yemen were meant to quash the Houthi rebels. That hasn't happened. No, indeed. And the Houthi rebels said, in fact, after those strikes last Thursday evening, that they would retaliate. And uh, in the days that followed, we have seen some low-level incidents uh, with a missile that was launched towards an oil tanker that missed, uh, another missile yesterday launched towards a US destroyer uh, in the region. Uh, that was shot down by an aircraft from the USS Eisenhower aircraft carrier. But today, a significant escalation with three missiles, we're told, that were fired, according to US Central Command, by Houthi rebels. Those uh, Missiles, we're told, two of them landed short of their target, but one struck a US-owned container ship, a bulk carrier, uh, in the Gulf of Aden. You can see on the map there that the Gulf of Aden is that stretch of water just south of Yemen that leads up to the Red Sea itself, a key shipping route. And I think what it signifies, actually, is that the, the Houthi rebels have widened the scope of their targets now. Before they 
when they were attacking commercial shipping, they said that it was commercial shipping that was linked to Israel, either heading to or from Israel or owned uh, by Israel. Now it seems that they see both the US and indeed the UK as legitimate targets, given that those two nations were involved in those strikes against the Houthi rebels. OK, thank you, Mark Wyatt, for that update. Peace on a precipice in the Middle East. Once again, will the UK be dragged into another war? Now, there's lots more still to come. Between now and 4 o'clock, the Prime Minister is to address the Commons on his handling of the Middle East crisis shortly and will cross to Westminster live for that. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Sophia Wensler. Thank you, Martin. It's 3.31. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. The US military has confirmed an anti-ship ballistic missile struck a US-owned vessel southeast of Yemen's port of Aden. It's understood two missiles missed the container ship, but one struck, causing a fire in the cargo hold. No injuries have been reported. This latest attack is the second since the US and UK joint strikes on Houthi targets last week. The militant group have vowed to continue attacks in the Red Sea. Here in the UK, Rishi Sunak is preparing to face MPs' questions over whether the UK could deploy more airstrikes against the Houthis. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister says he'll overrule European human rights judges if they try to stop the UK sending migrants to Rwanda. That's as dozens of Conservative MPs call for the Rwanda bill to be toughened in a bid to deter people from making the dangerous journey in small boats across the Channel. Speaking exclusively to GB News, Rishi Sunak insists tackling illegal migration is the compassionate thing to do. Your heart breaks when you hear these stories about people dying. They're being exploited by criminal gangs, and that's why we've got to resolve this issue. There's lots of reasons why, and we should talk about them, but one of them is that innocent people are being exploited by criminal gangs. That's not right. There's nothing compassionate about it, and in fact, the compassionate thing to do is to tackle illegal migration, and that's what our Rwanda scheme will do. I've been Prime Minister for a year, just over, and in that... And now we're going to take you live to the Prime Minister, who's speaking in the House of Commons on the situation in Yemen. Consistent with the UN Charter and to uphold freedom of navigation, as Britain has always done. Yeah. 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 Alongside the United States, with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada and the Netherlands, we ordered the RAF to strike two Houthi military facilities in Yemen. I want to be clear that these were limited strikes. They were carefully targeted at launch sites for drones and ballistic missiles to, to degrade the Houthis' capacity to make further attacks on international shipping. I can tell the House today that our initial assessment is that all 13 planned targets were destroyed. At the drone and cruise missile base in Barney, nine buildings were successfully hit. A further three buildings were hit at Abs Airfield, along with a cruise missile launcher caught in the open. We have seen no evidence thus far of civilian casualties, which we took great care to avoid. I know the whole House will join me in paying tribute to the incredible bravery and professionalism of all our servicemen and women. Yeah. The need to maximise the security and effectiveness of the operation meant that it was not possible to bring this matter to the House in advance. But we took care to brief members before the strikes took place, including you, of course, Mr Speaker, and the Leader of the Opposition, and I have come to the House at the earliest possible opportunity. Mr Speaker, I do not take decisions on the use of force lightly. That's why I stress that this action was taken in self-defence. It was limited, not escalatory. It was a necessary and proportionate response to a direct threat to UK vessels and therefore to the UK itself. And Mr Speaker, let me be absolutely clear why the Royal Navy is in the Red Sea. They are there as part of Operation Prosperity Guardian, protecting freedom of navigation as a fundamental tenet of international law. The Houthis' attack on international shipping have put innocent lives at risk. They have held one crew hostage for almost two months, and they are causing growing economic disruption. Global commerce cannot operate under such conditions. Containers and tankers are having to take a 5,000-mile detour around the Cape of Good Hope. That pushes up prices and imperils the passage of goods, foods and medicines 
that the British people and others rely on. We have attempted to resolve this through diplomacy. After numerous international calls for the attacks to stop, a coalition of countries gave the Houthis a clear and unambiguous warning two weeks ago. Last week, the UN Security Council passed a resolution condemning the attacks and highlighting the right of nations to defend their vessels and preserve freedom of navigation. Yet, the Houthis continued on their reckless path. Mr Speaker, we shouldn't fall for their malign narrative that this is about Israel and Gaza. They target ships from around the world. We continue to work towards a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza and to get more aid to civilians. We also continue to support a negotiated settlement in Yemen's civil war. But I want to be very clear that this action is completely unrelated to those issues. It is a direct response to the Houthis' attacks on international shipping. And we should also recognise the risks of inaction. It would weaken international security and the rule of law, further damage freedom of navigation in the global economy, and send a dangerous message that British vessels and British interests are fair game. And there is another point here which is often overlooked. The Houthis' attack risks worsening the dire humanitarian situation in Yemen itself. The UK helps to feed around 100,000 Yemenis every month, with aid arriving via the very sea routes that the Houthis have in their sights. So, Mr Speaker, the threats to shipping must cease. Illegally detained vessels and crews must be released, and we remain prepared to back our words with actions. But, Mr Speaker, dealing with this threat does not detract from our other international commitments. Rather, it strengthens our determination to uphold fundamental UN principles. If our adversaries think that they can distract us from helping Ukraine by threatening international security elsewhere, they could not be more wrong. On Friday, I travelled to Kyiv to meet President Zelensky and address the Ukrainian parliament. I took a message from this House to the RADA that we will stand with Ukraine today, tomorrow, and for as long as it takes. If Putin wins in Ukraine, he won't stop there, and other malign actors will be emboldened. That's why Ukraine's security is our security. That's why the UK will stay the course. And it's why I'm confident that our partners share our resolve. And so far from our resolve faltering, our military support to Ukraine will increase this year. We will provide the single biggest package of defence aid to Ukraine since the war began, worth £2.5 billion. This will include more air defence equipment, more anti-tank weapons, more long-range missiles, thousands more rounds of ammunition and artillery shells, training for thousands more Ukrainian servicemen and women, and the single largest package of advanced drones given to Ukraine by any nation. All of this is on top of what we have already provided to support Ukraine. In total, since the war began, the United Kingdom will have provided almost £12 billion of aid to Ukraine. We were the first to train Ukrainian troops, first in Europe to provide lethal weapons, first to commit main battle tanks, first to provide long-range missiles, and now we are the first to keep the promise made at the last year's NATO summit alongside 30 other countries to provide new bilateral security commitments. Mr Speaker, Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO, and NATO will be stronger with Ukraine in it. But these commitments will help bridge the gap until that day comes. Under the new agreement that we signed with President Zelensky, we are building Ukraine's military capabilities, and if Russia ever invades Ukraine again, we will provide swift and sustained assistance, including modern equipment across land, air and sea. Together with our allies, the UK will be there from the first moment until the last. For all of this, Mr Speaker, I bring a message of thanks from President Zelensky to the British people. And today I hope that this House will join me in sending a message back to the Ukrainian people that we stand together as one in support of these firm commitments. We are building a new partnership with Ukraine, designed to last 100 years or more. Yes, it's about defence and security, but it's also about trade, investment, culture and more. 
And there could be no more powerful sign of our unique bond than Ukraine's decision to adopt English as the language of business and diplomacy. And so through the British Council, we're going to fund English language training for the Ukrainian people. So, Mr Speaker, in dangerous times, we are investing in defence, hardening our critical infrastructure, building our alliances, and we are resolute in our principles. International security, the rule of law, and freedom to determine your own future. An attack on those principles is an attack on everything that we believe in and on which our lives and livelihoods depend. As the home of parliamentary democracy and a leader in collective security, it is our responsibility to defend those principles and to defend our people. That is who we are. That is what Britain does and will always do. And I commend this statement to the House. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister? Okay, that was Rishi Sunak giving a speech on peace and security in the Red Sea and in the Ukraine. And we'll be now, we'll now talk to our Home and Security Editor. No, we're going to a break now. We'll reflect on that speech after this break, when we will speak to Mark White to get his take on that speech just delivered by Rishi Sunak in the comments. I'm Martin Dorby on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. Okay. Here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Welcome back. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, a short while ago, we heard the Prime Minister address the House of Commons on the Red Sea and Ukraine. And I believe now we can cross back because Keir Starmer is responding. Seventh. Israel's right to self-defence is fundamental, as is its duty to comply with international law. And the longer this conflict in Gaza rages, the more the risk of escalation throughout the entire region. On the Israel-Lebanon border, we must urge constraint. We must make it crystal clear to all parties that the UK does not support this conflict extending further in Lebanon. While within Israel and Palestine, in the West Bank, settler violence must stop immediately. And in Gaza, we need a humanitarian truce now, not as a short pause, but as the first step on a road away from violence. The need for a sustainable ceasefire is clear. To stop the killing of innocent civilians, to create the space for the return of all the hostages, and to provide urgent humanitarian relief to protect against disease and ward off a devastating famine. Mr Speaker, from that first step, we can begin a bigger push towards peace a permanent end to the fighting and a lasting political solution. The hope of the two-state solution is fragile, but it is still there and we must fight for it, just as we must also remain resolute in the face of aggression which threatens global security, whether that's in Europe or the Red Sea. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Uh, can I thank OK, that was Keir Starmer responding to Rishi Sunak. And I'm joined now by GB News' home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, let's start with um, Rishi Sunak. He made it very clear, Mark, that the response of the Houthis was nothing to do with the Israel-Gaza conflict and actually pointed out that U the UK helps to feed 100,000 Yemenis a month through the precise shipping channels that the pirates are targeting. Yes, of course. I mean, that's the, the view of the British government, the stated view of the US government and other Western uh, countries, allies of Israel. But of course, from the perspective of the rebels, uh, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, the ones, of course, who are launching these attacks, they say they are doing this in support of the Palestinian people, whether uh, that's right-minded or wrong-minded. At the end of the day, that's their justification for launching these attacks. And they say that the attacks have been limited or initially were limited to commercial shipping that was linked to Israel or coming to uh, or from, uh, going to or coming from Israel. Um, I think some of the links were quite tenuous, uh, to be honest, but almost 30 such attacks on commercial shipping that happened in recent months there were repeated warnings from the US and the UK about the potential for strikes on these rebels if they persisted. They continued. And then, of course, the back end of last week, we got the strikes that Rishi Sunak has now been uh, giving his response to in the Commons. What I think is unclear, for me anyway, um, is that we are hearing time and again from the Prime Minister and other senior government ministers that these strikes are limited. But to be honest, that's not in the gift of the government uh, in the sense that the Houthi rebels have decided they are responding and they are continuing to strike. We've been reporting the breaking news that three more missiles, ballistic missiles, have been launched at a US-owned container ship, a bulk carrier, out in the Gulf of Aden, uh, in the stretch of sea that leads up uh, to the Red Sea, that one of these missiles has struck that vessel. Also, now reports coming out of the Yemen port city of Hudeda of an explosion. Uh, that may well be linked uh, to what is going on here. So it may be despite the stated aim of Rishi Sunak and others to have a limited involvement here, that actually getting involved and joining the US in these strikes means that they have to continue in this effort to degrade and stop uh, the Houthi rebels from continued attacks. And the Houthi rebels, at the moment at least, don't seem to be in any mood to stop. 
And Mark, again, Rishi Sunak keen to point out in the 13 targets that were destroyed, including a cruise missile launcher, there were no signs of civilian casualties. I guess that's cohesive with the fact we probably would have seen that footage from the Houthis if that were the case. Actions were in self-defence necessary and proportionate. But then they would say that, wouldn't they? I don't suppose that will calm down the Houthis. How serious is it, Mark, that they're launching missiles at US flagged craft? And what can we expect from the Americans in response? I think it's very serious, Martin. And mm. it's not just US flagged uh, commercial shipping. A US destroyer um, was targeted Yesterday, um, we understand a missile fired towards that Arleigh Burke class destroyer. Uh, the weapon systems on board the ship took that missile out. And then on Friday, there was another missile that was launched towards an oil tanker uh, in the Gulf of Aden as well. So this latest strike, the fact that a missile has actually struck the vessel. Now, the vessel is still seaworthy, uh, we're told. It caused a fire in the... Um, cargo hold, but that seems to have been contained. Uh, there are no reported injuries, but nonetheless, it is a serious escalation. The fact that three ballistic missiles have been launched towards the ship, one of them striking that ship, despite the um, very clear warnings from the US and the UK that they wouldn't hesitate to strike back if the Houthis continued. As I say, this gets to the point uh, of uh, what the language that's coming from Rishi Sunak. He wants to uh, tell everybody, including Parliament, that this is limited and proportionate, but... It's only limited and proportionate if the Houthis decide to play ball and decide not to continue attacking. Well, there's no sign that that is the case. They seem intent on continuing to attack shipping and naval vessels out in that region. If they continue to do that, what's going to happen? Are we going to be dragged into a more significant operation against the Houthis? Well, we don't know as yet. Mark, the Houthis' slogan is death to Israel, death to America and damn the Jews. They're being well financed and well, um, they will be well equipped by the Iranians in the area. They won't say that this is nothing to do with Gaza. They will try and fan the flames of that. Do they want this to um, puff up into something bigger? Do they want a war in the area between the West and them and their allies? Well, the Houthis are enjoying somewhat uh, of a resurgence in terms of popular support uh, among Arab populations in that region because of their stated support for the Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, while there's no love lost between Arab governments, or many Arab governments, and the Houthi rebels, certainly there is popular support, and they feel empowered. They are a belligerent and a battle-hardened rebel group that may well decide that the calculation is best for them to continue taking the fight to the US and the UK now. OK, Mark White, thank you for the update. Precarious situation piece on a knife edge. Uh, Rishi Sunak saying the, the attacks were proportionate, uh, but that's not being taken that way by the Houthi rebels who are now attacking American flagged craft in the Red Sea. A delicate situation. Rishi Sunak has just spoken on that. And, of course, we will have, we will have a full um, update on that after this. I'm Martin Daldney on GB News. This is Britain's News Channel. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, Alex Merkel here again with your latest GB News weather forecast. The cold theme is going to continue as we go through much of this week, and with that, there is the risk of some heavy snow for some of us. At the moment, there is a cold Arctic air plunging down from the north across the UK as we are sandwiched in between high pressure to the west and low pressure towards the east. On that northerly wind, we have already seen plenty of snow showers, and they will continue overnight, most likely across parts of northern Scotland, but also some western areas and also eastern parts in areas exposed to that northerly wind, we have the risk of seeing some further wintry showers. Further inland, staying largely dry with clear skies, and as a result, we're going to see temperatures dropping, most places falling a few degrees below freezing, so a fairly widespread, and for some of us, harsh frost first thing tomorrow morning. Otherwise, and as we go through tomorrow, watch out for a spell of more persistent rain, sleet and snow pushing in across parts of Northern Ireland, central southern Scotland, and into northern England too, could bring several centimetres of snow, so some disruption is possible. Further north, we're across northern parts of Scotland, 
Scotland. More snow showers likely here. Meanwhile, staying dry, bright and often sunny across the rest of England and Wales, but staying cold. Into Wednesday, and we need to watch out for a system towards the south of us. It may avoid the UK, but there's a chance it may just fringe southern counties. And if it does so, that could bring some disruptive snow. Elsewhere, still the chance of some further snow showers for a time. It's likely to turn dry as we go towards the end of the week and temperatures will start to pick up just that little bit too. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 4pm. Welcome to the Martin Dalby Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up, an exclusive interview with the Prime Minister who faces growing pressure over a number of key issues, and they include a potential rebellion from within his own party over his flagship Rwanda policy. And in the past half hour, Rishi Sunak has defended his handling of the Middle East crisis, saying he was right to authorise military strikes against Houthis in the Red Sea. 
And in other news, the damning reports which found that girls were left at the mercy of paedophile grooming gangs for years in Rochdale because of failings by senior police and council bosses. And it's driving us potty. New figures show that pot toll related breakdowns have reached a five-year high. That's all coming in the next hour. And as usual, I'd love to hear from you. Please email me your views, gbviews at gbnews.com. Let us know what you think about that exclusive interview with Rishi Sunak. He says there's no problem that Rwanda bill will get through, that Strasbourg won't step in the way. The question is, will there be a rebellion and do you believe him? Let me know your thoughts. But before that, it's time for your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you, and good afternoon to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom today is that the US military has confirmed an anti-ship ballistic missile has struck a US-owned vessel southeast of Yemen's port of Aden. It's understood two missiles missed the container ship, but one struck, causing a fire in the cargo hold. No injuries were reported. But this latest attack is the second since the US and UK joint strikes on Houthi targets last week. The militant group have vowed to continue the attacks in the Red Sea. And here in the UK, Rishi Sunak has been addressing the Commons, answering questions over whether or not the UK could deploy more airstrikes against the Houthis. He said focus on the situation in Yemen will not detract from the UK's support for other crises around the world. The threats to shipping must cease. Illegally detained vessels and crews must be released and we remain prepared to back our words with actions. But, Mr Speaker, dealing with this threat does not detract from our other international commitments. Rather, it strengthens our determination to uphold fundamental UN principles. If our adversaries think that they can distract us from helping Ukraine by threatening international security elsewhere, they could not be more wrong. Well, Sir Keir Starmer says he understands the risk to UK security but warns against escalating trouble in the region. Military interventions by the UK government, particularly if they're part of a sustained campaign, should be brought before this House. Scrutiny is not the enemy of strategy. Because while we back the action taken last week, these strikes still do bring risk. We must avoid escalation across the Middle East. Well, in news here at home, it was revealed that more than 200 migrants crossed the English Channel in small boats at the weekend. That's despite poor weather conditions. And five people died on the French side of the Channel yesterday after getting into difficulties just off the coast near Boulogne. As you've been hearing, girls were left at the mercy of paedophile grooming gangs due to failings by senior police and council leaders. That's according to a comprehensive new report covering nearly 10 years of failed investigations by Greater Manchester Police. It highlights years of widespread organised sexual abuse of children in the Rochdale area, despite what it described as compelling evidence reported to the authorities as early as 2004. Greater Manchester Police Chief Constable Stephen Watson says the report does paint a damning picture. The findings evidenced within it are shocking, stark and shameful. It speaks to the systemic failure of various agencies to pull together and do the obvious and the right thing. And above all, it outlines in painful detail all of those missed opportunities where decisive action could and should have been taken. Now, in Israel, two Palestinians have carried out coordinated car rammings, killing one woman and injuring at least 12 others. Images from the scene of one of the attacks near Tel Aviv show several damaged vehicles as emergency services attended. Police described the incident as a terrorist attack and said two suspects are under arrest. No claim yet of any responsibility. 
Here, commuters are in for a fresh series of delays as the ASLEF train union announces more strike action. Drivers will take part in a rolling programme of one-day walkouts from the end of this month, including an overtime ban. The union says it's aiming to put pressure on what it describes as a tone-deaf government, calling for drivers to get their first pay rise in five years. And a volcano that erupted yesterday in Iceland is sending lava flowing into nearby villages, covering houses. If you're watching on television, take a look at these live shots coming to us from Grindavik, where a volcano's still bursting with lava, smoke billowing into the air, lava shooting upwards and running down channels along the sides. The second eruption in the country's southwest in less than a month with the Prime Minister of Iceland warning residents to take care there, saying it is a very dangerous situation. That's the news on GB News across the UK on TV, in your car on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel. Thank you, Polly. Welcome to the show. And it's set to be a crucial week for the Prime Minister, who's coming under growing pressure for his flagship Rwanda policy once again and his decision to take military action on Houthis in the Middle East. Rishi Sunak visited Lee on sea in Essex this morning and played down polling, suggesting that the Tories could be on course for a 1997 Blair style wipeout at the next general election. Well, the Prime Minister gave an exclusive interview to our political editor, Chris Hope, saying he had full confidence, of course he would say that, in his Rwanda plan. Another tragic example of what this illegal trade is doing to innocent people. And, you know, my, you know, your heart breaks when you hear these stories about people dying. They're being exploited by criminal gangs, and that's why we've got to resolve this issue. There's lots of reasons why, and we should talk about them, but one of them is that innocent people are being exploited by criminal gangs. That's not right. There's nothing compassionate about it, and, in fact, the compassionate thing to do is to tackle illegal migration, and that's what our Rwanda scheme will do. I've been Prime Minister for a year, just over, and in that time we've actually reduced the number of people coming here by over a third. That hasn't happened before. No one else has managed to achieve that. That's because we've done lots of good work. Well, Rishi there sticking to his guns, and I'm joined now in the studio by Peter Dowd, Labour MP for Bootle. You must be delighted. The Tories are revolting. Rishi says his plan is going to work, Peter, but there looks to be a bit of a standoff this week. And as a Labour MP, you must be just enjoying the spectacle of them imploding once again. Well, I take a view which is the country's in a, in a state, economically, socially, cohesion is, is, is in its boots. I look forward to a Labour government. I don't take any... Uh, I don't. I don't get any benefit. I don't think there's any advantage to me. Sort of letting the Tories go on any further. Bottom line is we need change, and that's what I'm looking forward mm. to. And we'll fight the Conservatives and any other party on our policies uh, as and when the general election is called. One thing, um, Peter, that Rishi kept saying in his sit down with GB News is Keir Starmer doesn't have a plan on how to stop the boats. In fact, he's voted against it every single time. Do you have a plan? Well, the plan certainly isn't trying to get people to Rwanda. It's been knocked back num a number of times. The plan from Labour, what we're saying is that you have to have international agreements. That's, that's, that's a must. The Conservatives don't want an international agreement. The Prime Minister just uh, talked about smuggling, uh, tackling smuggling gangs. When? Where? How many? Mm -hmm. How many have been challenged? There are people in this country who are part of those gangs. There are people abroad who are part of those gangs. What are we doing to tackle that? And that's what Labour will do. It's about partnership. Whether, whether the Tories like it or not, there's got to be some partnership with the continent. And that brings us to my next question. One of those uh, mooted deals with the continent is a returns deal with the European Union. And that could reciprocate 100,000 of the EU's illegals coming into the UK. So people saying that's bad for Britain. And also it could be rowing back towards a closer alignment with the European Union from Keir Starmer. Well, the, the bottom line is, whether we like it or not, as I said, the, 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 Europe is across the channel. We have trading relationships with, we have political relationships with. The, the fact of the matter is, whether in, whether in the European Union or without, we've got to have good relations with our partners. And they are our partners, it's not as pretending they're not. And that's what our focus of attention has got to be on, not just in relation to smuggling, but in relation to trade and our political relationships, our military relationships, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, really. Would you like to see um, the UK getting closer to Brussels? 
Well, I think it's a question of negotiation, isn't it? We, we, we've got pretty poor relations with Europe, so it's first steps first. Let's t talk to them, let's negotiate with them at the end of the day, and I repeat, I sound like a stuck record, they are our neighbours, we are their neighbours. Whether they, whether we like it or not, we have trading relationships. Let's just try and make the best of the, of the relationship that we have and try and build upon that. That does sound like a yes. It does sound like Labour Party would like to get closer to Brussels despite the fact we, we Brexited. Well, well, personally, I'd like to get closer to Brussels because it's in our interest, but it isn't just about Brussels. It's a reciprocal relationship. I'm sure they'd like to have a better relationship with us. It doesn't mean, say, you're pro this or against that. What you're for overall is a good relationship. OK, Peter, let's look at that poll in today's Telegraph of all places. Predicting a Blair-style general election wipeout for the Conservatives, the Tory would win 196 fewer seats than in mm. 2019, and that's a bigger loss than John Major faced against Blair. I want to ask you about this. 96 of those seats this poll is predicting is because of the Reform Party splitting the votes. What do you make of the Reform Party? Are they helping Labour? Well, Labour will fight a general election on its policies, on its terms, and quite frankly, I don't care who our opposition are, or the Tories' opposition, for that matter, in terms of reform, or the Liberal Democrats, it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. We'll go to the polls, make the case for Labour, make the case for change. That's the position I come from, so I really don't care who stands against us or who stands against the Tories, for that matter. OK, Peter, when Liam Byrne left that note for David Cameron saying mm. there's no money left, mm. there were, we were a mere £97 mm. billion pounds in debt now with £2.6 mm. trillion pounds in debt. It's a huge problem the Labour Party will face, is irrespective of how well-meaning your policy is, there's simply no money left. Well, I think that's what we've got to... We, that's the challenge for us. When, when You talked about 1997. When Labour took control in 1997, the economy was growing at about 2% a year. It grew throughout the 90s at 2 or 3%. We're not mm. going to inherit that. So it is a big mm. challenge, and no-one's pretending otherwise. It is going to be a big challenge. And that's also the message we'll be sending to, to the public. We will be telling the honest truth about the economy. OK, super. Peter Dowd, Labour MP for Boodle. Thanks for joining us in the studio here in Westminster for GB News. Now, GB News' political editor Chris Hope joins me now. Hello again, Chris. Another superb exclusive with Rishi Sunak sticking to his guns. A very dramatic sunset. Beautiful picture there behind you, Lee Onsey. Is the sun going down on the Rishi Sunak government, I guess is my question. Well, when I arrived here, the tide was out. And that was my other metaphor for this morning, but now it's come in again. I mean, the PM hopes that it might come back for him. Of course, the crucial 48 hours coming for him. He's got these votes tomorrow night on the initial issue of whether um, the government can ignore, uh, blanket ignore ECHR rulings. And then Wednesday, the votes for the amendments on from Robert Jenrick about tweaking the rules to make, make this a deal uh, to deport um, migrants to Rwanda much more secure from courts. And then probably Wednesday evening, we're facing this third reading vote, an all or nothing vote, if no amendments are made by the government, you've heard from Swella Braben on Friday to the GB News exclusively, she will vote down the bill. If um, more try and do that from the Tory side, the bill falls and the polls today will be the hors d'oeuvre before a catastrophic uh, stake banquet for the PM on Wednesday night. And in terms of those polls, um, do you think Rishi seems troubled by the fact that Telegraph today predicted that 96 of those seats, Chris, will be benefited towards the Labour Party because of the Reform Party? Well, that's right. The PM said that polls will come and go. There are hundreds more this year, he said. I mean, what more can he say? But those MRP polls from YouGov, they did forecast, or pretty well much forecast, the 2017 and 2019 results of the general election. They are ones not to ignore. Now, people on the right of the party meeting tonight, the European Research Group of Tory MPs, the New Conservatives, they want the PM to toughen up his stance on this bill, make it tougher and harder for lawyers to ignore um, rulings to deport to Rwanda. They want that to happen, but the question is, will he allow it? He daren't do it because he might uh, collapse the deal with Rwanda on the one hand. On the other hand, the One Nation uh, left with...
will not accept it. So he's walking along a very narrow uh, ledge here at the moment, but the PM was on fighting talk early, fighting form, I thought. Um, I asked him about whether he felt he was out of touch because of his, of his, uh, his large wealth he earned in the city, married well into a family um, that owned, uh, owned a chunk of emphasis. But he said, well, no one made those points when I was setting up the, um, the furlough scheme, which helps only uh, families to stay afloat during the COVID pandemic. He said, and that, of course, is the tone of this general election campaign. More of that, I imagine, in coming months from Labour. OK, Chris, so thank you for joining us from a beautiful Lee on Sea and another cracking exclusive. Thank you, Chris Hope. Now, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak tells the House of Commons Houthi rebels threats the commercial shipping in the Red Sea must stop. Speaking to MPs, he insisted the UK and US military as joint strikes last Thursday were the last resort. It was a necessary and proportionate response to a direct threat to UK vessels and therefore to the UK itself. And Mr Speaker, let me be absolutely clear why the Royal Navy is in the Red Sea. They are there as part of Operation Prosperity Guardian, protecting freedom of navigation as a fundamental tenet of international law. The Houthis' attack on international shipping have put innocent lives at risk. They have held one crew hostage for almost two months, and they are causing growing economic disruption. And this is as the US military confirms the Iranian-backed Houthis launched three missiles, with one hitting a US-owned ship in the Gulf of Aden near Yemen. And I'm joined now by GB News' home and security editor, Mark White. Mark, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. Rishi Sunak defiant there, saying that these actions were of those of self-defence, necessary and proportionate. He also thought this would quash the rebels. But, Mark, that hasn't happened. In fact, hostilities are intensifying. Yes, indeed. And uh, Rishi Sunak was at pains to point out that the action taken last week was limited in nature. However, uh, it clearly uh, is now uh, uncertain as to what the response from the UK will be going forward, given that we've had these fresh strikes as the Houthi rebels uh, warned they would actually uh, launch in response to the strikes that took place from the US and the UK. And there wasn't really an answer from Rishi Sunak about that, except to say that he wouldn't go into what any future action might entail or in, even, indeed, whether that might happen, clearly, for security reasons. Now, this ship that was struck by uh, missiles was a bulk carrier, the Gibraltar Eagle. Uh, it was carrying steel uh, products. Uh, it's a US-owned vessel. Now, the ship's owners say that the, vehicle, uh, that the vessel did suffer damage, damage, we understand, to a cargo hold on the port side. There were no injuries, and the ship owners say that the vessel is able uh, to continue and will continue uh, to its next port. Uh, but really, clearly, uh, an escalation as the Houthis according to the US Central Command, launch three of these missiles at this container ship. And what it also shows is that the Houthis are now widening their scope in terms of targets. Before, they claimed that the commercial shipping that they were targeting was linked to Israel, either owned by the Israelis or heading to or from uh, Israel, but now it seems that they are viewing the US and probably the UK as legitimate targets for taking part in these strikes last week. And this also follows a very worrying situation and an incident yesterday in which a missile was aimed at a US destroyer, the Arleigh Burke destroyer USS Laboon. The self defense weapon systems on that ship, the missiles were launched to take out uh, this missile before it could reach the US warship, but clearly an escalation. And one more thing to add to this, Martin, uh, reports coming out now of an explosion in the Yemen port city of Hadeda that may well be linked to what's going on in terms of the Houthi rebels continuing with their strikes. Nothing yet from the US military confirming they have struck any targets in Yemen, but this 
uh, western port city of Hodeida uh, reports that there was an explosion near the airport in that city. OK, Mark White, thank you for that update. It feels once again like the West is being pulled into another war in the Middle East. And we'll have lots more on that story at five o'clock. And there's plenty of coverage on our website, gbnews.com. And you've helped to make it the fastest growing national news website in the country. So thank you very much. Coming up, a damning report say senior police and council bosses failed girls subjected to paedophile grooming gangs in Rochdale. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Pretty mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Carson, this Saturday night showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday night showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's 4.24. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, a report into grooming gangs in Rochdale has been published today, stating that young girls were left at the mercy of paedophile grooming gangs because of failings by senior police and council bosses. Well, joining me now is GB News' reporter, Charlie Peters. Charlie, a damning report, long overdue, and containing some extremely disturbing details. What's the latest? 
That's right, and I think the top of those disturbing findings is that the team has identified some 96 men that it believes still pose a risk to children and that many of them have not been prosecuted. There are also many findings within the report that disruption activities and strategies by the police and the local council to disrupt the child sexual exploitation gangs were deplorable in their failures and that also there were findings of widespread sexual abuse within Greater Manchester and Rochdale in particular from 2004. But this report, while continuing a long theme of exposing cover-ups and failures by police, is rather different from many of the other reviews we've seen into town, such as Rotherham and, of course, Telford, insofar as it doesn't actually list political correctness or a nervousness around race as one of the reasons why the police or social services failed to act. There is only one mention in the 173 pages about a nervousness around ethnicity. It said that one senior investigating officer was concerned that a strategy to target taxi drivers who have Pakistani heritage would be seen as being tarred with the racial brush. And so the team was nervous around doing that and didn't go forward with that disrupting activity. I spoke to Gary Ridgway, one of the report's co-authors, about the inclusion of that testimony and why a wider coverage of the ethnicity issue wasn't in the report. When you look at what the quote was from that senior investigating officer, there's some, there would be some challenge anyway to what he was suggesting because you're talking about um, racial profiling. You're saying, well, we're going to stop Asian, every Asian taxi driver. Um, so I would imagine if that was a genuine suggestion, there might be some, well, hang on, we, we might say, well, we need to stop taxi drivers where there's children, unaccompanied children in the, in the taxi. That's completely different to saying we're stopping every Asian taxi driver. So although his, his point was well made, and the point we make in our report is that there's lots of ways to disrupt these people. There's lots of ways to disrupt ta taxis, take takeaways. You can challenge them. There's, there's a whole host of tactics police and local authorities can use if you believe an individual is committing serious crime. And obviously, raping children is the most one of the most serious crimes we can talk about. Well, that response from Gary Ridgway was part of a wider discussion taking place today. We also sat down with Maggie Oliver to discuss her response to this report, some seven years in the making since it was launched in 2017. She was grateful for the work that had been done, but expressed concern after Andy Burnham and the wider report team said that many of the people they approached refused to engage with the inquiry and often sent back written reports that didn't engage with the questions being posed. Here's what Maggie had to say. I am grateful. I'm grateful to Andy Burnham for ordering these reviews. Um, I am really grateful to Gary and Malcolm for standing their ground because they have met obstacles at every stage of this journey. What this report doesn't really cover is the battle it's been to get this truth out there. The lies, the cover-ups, the gaslighting, all those things are forgotten in a report like this. Well, all of those things being forgotten, perhaps by the report, but not by the survivors and indeed the whistleblowers, such as Maggie and Sarah Rowbotham, the member of the crisis intervention team, who today said that she was vindicated by the findings. And also, towards those who didn't contribute to the report, she said, shame on you. This review team will now enter its fourth and final stage by looking at contemporary failings within child sexual exploitation in Manchester. Maggie Oliver and many other survivors have alleged today that the failings that have been discovered in this report are still ongoing. Charlie Peters, thank you for that update. It's an astonishing situation um, that we find ourselves in here. Um, look at the post office scandal. The grooming scandal predated that. Maggie Oliver, um, an absolute living legend to have fought on tirelessly campaigning for survivors, victims. Some of the detail coming out of this report today is enough to make you weep. Um, the Greater Manchester Police took no action in the case of a 15-year-old girl who gave birth to a child 
of her pimp. Um, when cases did eventually reach court, some of the victims continued to be harassed and intimidated by the men who had previously abused them, sometimes at gunpoint. And as for this idea that raising difficult questions around the Muslim men in this, because it was predominantly Muslim men, that's not racist, it's just the truth. When those questions were raised, the media, politicians, the council and the police, they turned a blind eye and they totally abandoned these poor, ostensibly white, working-class girls who were just abandoned and thrown to the wolves and let down in the most astonishing and shameful way. One child told Greater Manchester Peace that her abusers kept girls in cages and made them bark like a dog or dress like a baby, but took no action when she left Greater Manchester and was put in care elsewhere. <sighs> And Maggie Oliver there saying this still carries on to this day. Those of us who believe that this has gone away are, I think, helping this to continue. So this report is important. Thank you, Maggie Oliver, for fighting on and on and on and giving those poor girls a voice. Now, there's lots more still to come between now and five o'clock. It's driving us potty. New figures show the UK hitting a five-year high for reports of potholes. We'll bring you all of the latest. But first, here's your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The top stories this hour. Rishi Sunak says Houthi rebels are continuing on a reckless path after the latest attack on a container ship southeast of Yemen's port of Aden. The US military has confirmed an anti ship ballistic missile struck a US owned vessel this afternoon, causing a fire in the cargo hold. It's the second missile attack since the US UK joint strikes on Houthi targets last week. The militant group has vowed to continue the attacks despite international condemnation. And speaking in the last hour, Rishi Sunak told the Commons the situation in the Yemen won't detract from the UK's support for other crises around the world. The threats to shipping must cease. Illegally detained vessels and crews must be released and we remain prepared to back our words with actions. But, Mr Speaker, dealing with this threat does not detract from our other international commitments. Rather, it strengthens our determination to uphold fundamental UN principles. If our adversaries think that they can distract us from helping Ukraine by threatening international security elsewhere, they could not be more wrong. And Zakir Starmer says he understands the risk to UK security but warns against escalating trouble in the region. Military interventions by the UK government particularly if they're part of a sustained campaign, should be brought before this House. Yeah. Scrutiny is not the enemy of strategy. Yeah. Because while we back the action taken last week, these strikes still do bring risk. We must avoid escalation across the Middle East. Sakir Starmer. Now, a charity says parents are experiencing complete chaos as they try to access a new government scheme that's meant to provide 15 hours of free childcare. A survey of more than 6,000 parents across England found that just 11% were able to access a code allowing them to claim their entitlement. A spokesman for the government said the childcare application system is working as intended. And we're in for some chilly days ahead, we're told, as cold air blowing in from the Arctic is bringing with it snow and ice. National Highways has issued a severe weather alert for snow affecting the northwest of the UK, with people advised to stick to main roads. The Met Office warning temperatures will be around six degrees lower than usual for this time of year. And a snow and ice warning is also in place until tomorrow across Northern Ireland, Scotland, and East Anglia. More on all those stories by heading to our website, gbnews.com. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Quick look at the day's markets. The pound buying you $1.2731 and €1.1628. The price of gold is £1,613.04 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has, uh, is standing at the moment at 7,588 points.
Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. Now, the state of UK roads is often a cause for concern amongst motorists, and research by the AA shows they dealt with over an astonishing 600,000 pothole-related incidents last year, costing motorists an estimated 500 million quid's worth of vehicle damage. Half a billion quid's worth of damage. We're joining now from Staffordshire is GB News reporter Will Hollis. Will, it's National Pothole Day. Not something to celebrate either, is it, mate? No, not a celebration at all, a day for awareness and campaigning, particularly at a local council level, making sure the council knows where the potholes are, particularly the dangerous ones. But, of course, there are more than ever, aren't there, right now, Martin? More than a million is what's estimated across the country, and there could be quite a lot more. And ultimately, what today is about is launching this pothole partnership where various different road user organisations are coming together, including the AA, JCB, which is based here uh, nearby in Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire, as well as the British Motorcyclist Federation and many others to say that the government needs to come together to create a long-term solution to fixing the pothole problems. The government might say, well, we've just uh, made a available £8.3 billion because we aren't doing HS2. But there is a five-point plan that's being put in place by the Pothole Partnership. And part of that five-point plan is saying that we need that funding now. We need it to be released today because it's a today problem. We don't need it over the 11 years that this money is earmarked for. And I was speaking to one member of the British Motorcyclists Federation, a, a guy called uh, Mr Morgan, Paul Morgan, uh, and he was telling me about how potholes can affect motorcyclists particularly, but where that money is needed right now. So the pothole problem is an acute problem and it's a real concern for British motorcyclists. Um, the pothole, which could damage a car quite seriously, actually represents a real danger to motorcyclists in terms of potentially coming off your bike and uh, 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 being seriously injured. And just that the problem with potholes is today, it's not in the future, it's today and it needs to be solved today. So we are concerned at the moment that the majority of the 8.3 billion which has now been allocated by government is back weighted. That needs to be front weighted and needs to be made available and ring fenced for local authorities today to address the problem. Well, it can be fatal for motorcyclists and cyclists using Britain's roads, but it can also be incredibly annoying and costly. And the figures that come out have come out today from the AI is that there's around £500 million estimated in damage just for last year alone, 2023, because of potholes, particularly things like punctures. It's about a 16% increase on the year before 2022 and a five-year high. So all of the signs are showing that our roads are getting worse, that it's worse to be a driver now than it was five years ago. And on National Pothole Day, it's a chance to get that attention in front of your politicians, whether that's your local council or your government, to say that we've got a problem and a lot of people want it to be fixed today, not in the future, Martin. Will Hollis, thank you for that update. I'm joined now by the living legend, none other than the man himself, Mr Pothole, Mark Morrill. Good afternoon, Mark. Now, you're a man who's done more for the pothole awareness business than anybody in Britain. You've been a constant thorn in the side of the powers that be for many, many years. And here we are on National Pothole Day, but still lots and lots of work to do, Mark. Yeah, I mean, we're sitting with a £14 billion backlog in carriageway works in England and Wales alone. So the £8.3 billion has been mentioned that they're asking for front-loaded. Great. But in realistic, realistic terms, that will resurface, they say, 5,000 uh, 5, miles of road. Well, that's uh, about 2% of the road network in the UK. So it's not doing a great deal. The networks deteriorate at a massive rate. All these indicators, breakdowns, increased insurance claims, is telling me what I've been saying for a number of years, that the road network in the UK is failing, and it's failing fast. And it's getting to the stage where, unless we get a long-term investment into resurfacing our roads, not just repairing potholes, resurfacing our roads to stop them at the source, then it's only going to get worse, and we're going to have a, a pothole Armageddon over the next five to ten years.
And Mark, some of the potholes out there are more like craters. Some of the worlds, the roads out there look like they're from the third world. I know my missus went through one before Christmas, completely wrecked the front rim, smashed the wheel up, serious damage, expensive stuff. And that's why people are really starting to take notice of this in ever increasing numbers, Mark, because the cost of these repairs are going through the roof at a time where the British public can least afford it. Exactly. Uh, and as uh, Will mentioned, you know, cyclists and motorcyclists, you know, it could be lethal. Um, but, yeah, people can't afford hundreds of pounds, even if they claimed off their fully comprehensive insurance, they can't afford hundreds of pounds on the excess when things are so tight. Um, but it needs that investment and it needs a long-term plan. Now, whatever party gets in the next general election, perhaps they need to sit down and go through what really needs to happen with our roads with a long-term plan for over the next 10, 15 years, front-loaded, yes, to a certain extent, but also ongoing uh, investment to prove that uh, you can actually get rid of probably 95% of the potholes in 10, 15 years if you actually spend the money wisely and do the job properly in the first place. And a big question that people always ask Mark about this is where does our road tax go? And, of course, most people aren't aware that despite the eye-watering annual costs, road tax doesn't actually go on the roads. No, that's correct. It goes into a general fund uh, and, you know, a very small amount goes back to uh, local authorities to carry out uh, works. Over £50 billion a year is raised from motorists and road users through various taxation. Uh, and currently they're spending about £1.2 billion, with the extra money of about £2 billion. But, you know, in 2006, we were spending £4 billion maintaining our roads. So if you allow for inflation, we should be spending something like six to £7 billion because the network's failing at £1.2 billion a year. OK, it's enough to make you weep, especially when you go through a pothole. Mr Pothole, Mark Morrill, thank you very much for joining us on GB News. Now, coming up, reports suggest that the late Queen was infuriated over Harry and Meghan's claim that she approved the name of her special childhood nickname, Lilibet. And our Royal Correspondents will have the story. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. 
Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces, scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Welcome back. It's 4.45. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, I've been covering reports that a US vessel near Yemen has been hit by a missile strike, raising the levels of tension, of course, in the Middle East. So what impact could this have on the UK's economy? Well, I'm joined now by GB News' economics and business editor Liam Halligan with On The Money. Hi, Liam. Welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. So, listen, mate, we were talking about the potential impact on the on the price of oil. Um, that seems to have remained pretty stable. Yet, three more vessels being attacked, Liam, that will, that, that will no doubt fuel tensions in the area and British consumers could be on the receiving end of a spike in prices. Martin, a lot of these geopolitical developments in far-flung places, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Straits of Hawaii, it all sounds a bit arcane, doesn't it? But it absolutely impacts the price of oil when we fill up our cars and vans on the forecourt with petrol and diesel. It absolutely impacts the price of pretty much everything that we buy, given the importance of global trade. Most of the attacks we've seen have been in the Red Sea. The Red Sea links uh, the Middle East with Europe via the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean and onto European and Western markets more generally. And that Suez Canal accounts for around 10% of the world's oil supplies. The Straits of Hormuz, 2,000 kilometres to the east, the entryway into the Persian Gulf, that's 25% of the world's oil supply goes in and out of there every day, and we saw attacks in the Straits of Hormuz last week, and you and I spoke about them. Now, I must say, since then, as you said, global oil markets have remained remarkably calm, considering. That's the Gulf of Aden there you see on the sea, or on your screen. You turn right there into the Red Sea and onto the Suez Canal. But global oil markets have remained relatively calm. We've seen an increase of like four, five, six percent in the price of oil from the low 70s to around $80 a barrel. That on its own will lead to an increase in petrol and diesel prices, but not anything that is going to really frighten the horses. The danger is that these attacks on oil tankers and freight more generally escalate with Iranian-backed Houthi rebels firing uh, or launching drones to um, disturb, to divert and to attack in general freight shipping. And also we've seen uh, the Iranians themselves, the Iranian military or proxies of the Iranian military, taking that oil tanker in the Straits of Hormuz, very close to Iran itself. Look, on Wednesday, we've got an inflation number coming out. The inflation number uh, for December. So far, inflation's fallen from well over 10% at the end of 2022 to just 3.9% in November. Much, much lower, but that's still more than almost twice the Bank of England's 2% target. A lot of people feel that interest rates are soon going to start coming down. You were already seeing mortgage rates coming down in anticipation of that. The Bank of England's raised interest rates to five and a quarter percent. But almost every economist in the land thinks that the next move is down and that the next move will come relatively soon, say in April or May. That will generate a feel-good factor. That means firms will invest more. That will get the economy moving. That's exactly why the Tories have delayed the date for the election, Rishi Sunas has made this pretty clear, until the second half of 2024. But guess what, Martin, and here's the thing. 
if these attacks on these oil tankers and freight tankers more generally going through the Red Sea, in particular going in and out of the Straits of Hormuz, if those attacks escalate and we see higher oil prices and we see higher prices for all components that come from Asia to the West because boats have to divert around the whole of Africa rather than going through the Suez Canal, we will get more inflation. The general downward trend in inflation that we've seen in recent months that we've all welcomed so much will be reversed. And then interest rates, rather than coming down, could actually start going up again, and that would upend politics. I'm not saying for a minute it will definitely happen. I'm not saying for a minute it's even very, very likely, but it's definitely possible. And that possibility is now being reflected in the oil price and certainly in the price of freight shipping, which has almost doubled since the middle of December. So at the very least, that will lead to price pressures and complicate and complicate the ability of the Western world to finally shake off this cost of living crisis and to finally get our economy back on track. OK, Liam Halligan, as ever, always on the money. Thanks for joining us on the show. You know, Liam put it so succinctly on Friday when he, when he, when he paraphrased Mike Tyson and said, everyone's got a plan until they get a punch in the face. The punch in the face for the economy for Rishi Sunak could be increasing tensions in the Red Sea. Because if these vessels are having to make 5,000-mile detours to get goods to Britain, that can only mean one thing. It means increased prices. Now, moving on, the Sussexers have come under fire as a senior palace source shares the late Queen was as angry as I've ever seen her. Well, this comes as the Sussexers revealed that the monarch had given her blessing for the naming of their daughter, Lilibet. And of course, that was the Queen's childhood special and beautiful nickname. So, did Harry and Meghan cause the Queen distress in her final years, final days, over the naming of their daughter? Well, let's speak now to our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Cameron, um, it's all kicking off again for the Sussexers this time because they used a sacred and beautiful nickname for the Queen. The big question is, were they allowed to do it? Did they get permission or not? Yeah, Martin, I think this is another example of recollections may vary. So all of these claims have come from a new book being published later this week by Robert Hardman. Now, he is really, really plugs in to the royal household. He has spoken to members of the royal family and their staff, past and present, and also produced this BBC documentary, which was aired on Boxing Day, behind the scenes of the cor coronation. So that gives you a bit of an example of the level of access he's got here and, and he's reporting um, what happened when Harry and Meghan chose the name Lilibet for their youngest daughter of course as you said uh, the late Queen's nickname for her close family and friends now after they announced that that was her name the BBC reported a palace source saying that the Queen was not asked by the Sussexes to use that name followed by that Harry and Meghan's lawyers wrote a very, let's be frank, quite quite, quite uh, ag aggressive, as some people have put it, or threatening uh, legal letter um, to all UK broadcasters and uh, newspapers saying that that claim is false and defamatory. A spokesperson for Harry and Meghan at the time said that the Duke spoke to his grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II, um, in advance and would not have used the name Lilibet if she hadn't given her blessing. And that is the line which seems to have upset the the late Queen, according to Robert Hardman. He says that one aide privately uh, speaking to him said that she uh, that they had never seen Queen Elizabeth II look so angry by Prince Harry appearing to claim that Queen Elizabeth II uh, had given her blessing for the name Lilibet. So it appears that recollections may vary on that one, but loads of uh, different uh, uh, other stories which seem to be coming out of this book, including that Prince William was very upset with Prince Harry for a appearing to attack his wife, Catherine, Princess of Wales, saying that uh, some people in the royal family, some males in the royal family, uh, choose their wives out of convenience of them fitting the mould of the royal household rather than for love. Thank you for that update on yet another right royal mess. Does it come down to this? Lilibet was a precious name, something sacred, something private, to have gone ahead and used that for a child's name without the Queen's permission. It's just yet another example, critics will say, of the astonishing arrogance of the Sussexes. Well, that's all for this hour, but please stay with me, as in the next hour I'm expected to be joined by our very own Nigel Farage, who, of course, is out in Iowa. Got a little um, compliment from Donald Trump last night. I'm Martin 
the opening on GB News, Britain's news channel. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Very good evening to you. I'm Alex Burkill here with your latest GB News weather forecast. The cold theme is set to continue and so it will stay frosty and icy at times with some snow showers too. But there is also the potential for some heavy persistent snow across northern parts as we go into Tuesday in association with a weather system currently towards the northwest of the UK. However, as we go through this evening and overnight, it's going to be cold. It's going to be frosty. We will see further snow showers feeding down on a brisk northerly wind, so particularly across northern Scotland and anywhere exposed to that northerly wind, that's where we're most likely to see the snow showers. Elsewhere, further inland, largely dry with some clear skies, and under the clear skies, a widespread frost, coldest across parts of Scotland, could get into negative double figures. As we go through Tuesday then, for much of England and Wales, and actually a largely fine day, again, some winter sunshine around, but further north, the potential for some persistent snow to push in across parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, and particularly across Scotland, could see more than uh, 10 centimetres of snow, perhaps, and so that could could cause some significant disruption. Again, it is going to be a cold day, temperatures a little bit below average for the time of year. As we look towards Wednesday, and there is a feature towards the south of the UK, currently likely just to stay to the south of us, but the potential it could bring a bit of significant snow to southern parts of the UK. Further north, looking largely dry, plenty of winter sunshine again, but some snow showers for far northern parts perhaps. Later on in the week, likely to turn dry and temperatures lifting a little bit too. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Whoa! Whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. 
every Sunday from 11. Join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, it's 5pm and welcome to the Martin Dalton Show on GB News, broadcasting live from the heart of Westminster all across the UK. Coming up in an exclusive interview with GB News, the Prime Minister has defended his flagship Rwanda policy as he faces yet another potential rebellion from within his own party when MPs vote on the bill this week. And more on those reports that a Houthi missile has hit a US ship off the coast of Yemen as tensions in the Middle East continue to grow. We'll be looking at how this could hit the UK economy. And in the past hour, Rishi Sunak has defended his handling of the Middle East crisis, saying he was right to authorise military strikes against Houthis in the Red Sea. And Gary Lineker is at it again. That's right. Old Big Ears this time has tweeted calling for Israel to be banned from international football competitions. Is it finally time for the BBC to give the red card to Lineker? That's all coming up in your next hour. And as usual, I'd like to hear from you. Email me, please, gbviews at gbnews.com, all the usual ways. It's time for Lineker to finally put a sock in it. It's not just sport, it's now talking about wars. And also, do you trust Rishi Sunak when he says that the Rwanda bill will get through, flights will take off and stick around? Because we'll be joining Nigel Farage, the toast of the town in Iowa, in the USA last night. Rishi Sunak, sorry, um, last night, Donald Trump was showering him with compliments tonight. He's broadcasting live from Iowa, 7 till 8pm. We'll cross stateside for the latest on what he thinks on that man, Rishi Sunak. But first, it's your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Martin, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom tonight is that Rishi Sunak says Houthi rebels are continuing on a reckless path after the latest attack on a container ship southeast of Yemen's port of Aden. The US military has confirmed today an anti-ship ballistic missile struck a US-owned vessel this afternoon. It caused a fire in the cargo hold and it's the second missile attack since the US and the UK joint strikes on Houthi targets last week. The militant group have vowed to continue those attacks as well, despite international condemnation. Well, earlier, Rishi Sunak told the Commons the situation in Yemen won't detract, though, from the UK's support for other crises around the world. The threats to shipping must cease. Illegally detained vessels and crews must be released, and we remain prepared to back our words with actions. But, Mr Speaker, dealing with this threat does not detract from our other international commitments. Rather, it strengthens our determination to uphold fundamental UN principles. If our adversaries think that they can distract us from helping Ukraine by threatening international security elsewhere, they could not be more wrong. Well, Sir Keir Starmer said he understood the risk to UK security but warned against escalating trouble in the region. Military interventions by the UK government, particularly if they're part of a sustained campaign, should be brought before this House. Scrutiny is not the enemy of strategy. Because while we back the action taken last week, these strikes still do bring risk. We must avoid escalation across the Middle East. Keir Starmer. Now, in other news today, it was revealed that more than 200 migrants crossed the English Channel in small boats at the weekend. That's despite the poor weather conditions. And five people died on the French side of the Channel yesterday after getting into difficulties just off the coast near Boulogne. Also today, girls were left at the mercy of paedophile grooming gangs. 
due to failings by senior police and council leaders in Manchester. That's according to a comprehensive new report covering nearly 10 years of failed investigations by Greater Manchester Police. It highlights years of widespread, organised sexual abuse of children in the Rochdale area, despite what it described as compelling evidence reported to the authorities as early as 2004. Former police detective Constable Maggie Oliver told GB News she's pleased to see the report, but it is too little, too late. It is the truth, but it's not a truth that was new to me. What makes me feel so angry is that it's taken 12 years to get it formally documented. And this isn't just a report. This is about lives destroyed. This is about children who have been criminalised, children who have been blamed, abusers who have been allowed to continue to abuse and go um, unchecked. Maggie Oliver talking to GB News. Now, the UK is to send 20,000 troops across Europe in, what, in, in what's been called a vital reassurance against the Putin menace. It'll include deployments from the Army, Navy and RAF, making it one of the largest NATO exercises since the Cold War. The drill involves 31 nations, with the Defence Secretary saying today troops will be prepared for the invasion of a NATO member state by any aggressor. Commuters are in for a fresh series of delays as the ASLEF union announces more strike action on the railways. Drivers are going to take part in a rolling programme of one-day walkouts from the end of this month, including a ban on overtime. The union says it's aiming to put pressure on what it describes as a tone-deaf Tory government calling for drivers to get their first pay rise in five years. A man's appeared in court over his plans to cause huge economic damage to the London Stock Exchange. 31-year-old Sean Middleborough appeared at Wirral Magistrates Court charged with conspiracy to cause a public nuisance. It's after an alleged plot to disrupt the UK's financial hub was revealed. The Met Police saying five other people were arrested yesterday. Three women and two men have been bailed pending further inquiries. And it's going to be very chilly in the days ahead. Cold air is blowing in from the Arctic. It's going to bring with it snow and ice to most parts of the country. National Highway saying there is now a severe weather alert in place for snow, particularly affecting the northwest, with people advised to stick only to main roads. The Met Office is warning temperatures are going to drop six degrees lower than usual for the time of year. And a snow and ice warning is also in place until tomorrow across Northern Ireland, Scotland and as far far south as East Anglia. Wrap up warm. This is GB News across the UK on TV, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker. This is Britain's News Channel. Thank you, Polly. Now we start with the growing pressure the Prime Minister is coming under over his handling of the immigration to the UK. Over the weekend, five migrants drowned in the English Channel after their small boats got into difficulties off the coast of France. And small boat crossings have resumed after a spell of bad weather, which temporarily paused small boats being able to cross the Channel, with the government yet to put in place any real deterrent to stop the crossings once and for all. Well, the Prime Minister has visited Lee on Sea in Essex today and he sat down with GB News' political editor, Christopher Hope, and here is a snippet of what he had to say. Another tragic example of what this illegal trade is doing to innocent people. And, you know, my, you know, your heart breaks when you hear these stories about people dying. They're being exploited by criminal gangs and that's why we've got to resolve this issue. There's lots of reasons why and we should talk about them but one of them is that innocent people are being exploited by criminal gangs. That's not right. There's nothing compassionate about it and in fact the compassionate thing to do is to tackle illegal migration and that's what our Rwanda scheme will do. I've been Prime Minister for a year, just over, and in that time we've actually reduced the number of people coming here by over a third. That hasn't happened before. No one else has managed to achieve that. That's because we've done lots of good work. Superb exclusive there from Chris Hope. I'm joined now in the studio by David Morris, MP for Morecambe and Loonsdale. And, of course, our, ca our political correspondent, Catherine Forster, to go over this. But first, I'd like to turn oh, to you, if I could. 
David. Rishi is, is, is resilient there. He's saying that the boats will be stopped and that those flights will take off. And, and here's the key point, those Rule 39 clauses will not come into effect because he is adamant that British law will be sovereign and we will not bow to Strasbourg. Do you have faith in that? I do. You see, the ECHR and the UK Bill of Human Rights are two separate entities. Every country in Europe can say no to the ECHR. The trouble is that we've got, under Tony Blair brought it in, the, the UK Human Rights Act, ECHR law supersedes ours. So therefore, a big problem is the domestic law, and this is what the Rwanda Bill is trying to address. And the point is, we've been speaking to immigration lawyers for months and months and months on GBN News, and they've all said to us, UK law can be sovereign, it can be supreme, yes. it just lacks the politicians with the guts to actually do it. Are we finally seeing Rishi get his mojo on this topic? I think we are. I know that, look, I'm talking about all of the, um, the family, shall we call them, in Parliament, on the opposition benches as well as the government benches. Everybody has an idea of what they want to see in it, which is fair and it is, it's just to do that. However, we've got to find the consensus to get this across the line because I've just been watching your, um, your news clip about people coming across the channel and some died, sadly, not so long ago, a few days ago. Um, the reality is, I don't blame those people coming here. I know some of your viewers will be saying, well, what's, what's that about, you know, from a Conservative MP? They're coming here for a better life. They've got free education, free schooling. The children can grow up in a safe environment. Why wouldn't you want to come here? It's up to the government, irrespective of political colour, to stop this from happening. If you're a legal immigrant coming in, fine. But if you're an illegal Im immigrant, you should be stopped from doing so. And this is a deterrent. And if they know they're going to go to Rwanda, it's going to focus their attentions remarkably. But the big issue, of course, is that even a lot of your own mob, you know, 60 or so, don't trust Sunak on this. There's rumours of a rebellion coming uh, coming up. Robert Jemrick, Suella Braverman, Lee Anderson, Jonathan Goodis was sat mm. where you are earlier. He's mm. going to be one of them too. If, if your own MPs don't trust the Prime Minister, why should the public? I think our own MPs want to see the government, the Prime Minister, whichever configuration want to look at that, do something to appease their wishes. Don't forget they're in seats which have termed the red wall, which wanted to see a stop to immigration, especially with voting for Brexit. And it's how we make Brexit work. So I can understand why they're very emotive about this and very concerned about it. And, you know, I, I look at things through the prism of pragmatism. Mm. And I think we will find a way through it. And I think we will get the bill through tomorrow night. OK. Um I think a lot of people on this channel would no doubt concur. As we saw with Brexit, a lot of chests were being puffed up, but in the end, you fell into line and went with it. But what about this poll that's out today in The Telegraph, predicting, as they call it, a 1997-style Blair wipeout, mm. dropping more seats to Keir Starmer than John Major did to Tony Blair, even. We're talking cataclysmic results if you believe the polls. And a big part of that, David, is the impact of the Reform Party. According to this polling, 96 of those seats would be handed to Labour because Reform would be taking votes. What would you say to Richard Tice if he was watching this now? Look, with polls, I mean, truthfully, I can remember, this reminds me a lot of when I was running up to the 2015 election and Lord Ashcroft did a poll which predicted I would lose my seat very badly. Yes, I won it with a 5,000 majority. You look at the granular um, sample of people who've been polling and you look into that, and from what I've seen, and maybe you can get someone on from YouGov to explain it, because I can't fathom it, only what I'm looking at, which is when you've got roughly a 1,000 voters and you've got 300 Conservatives, 600 Labour and 100 Liberal Democrats in the round, I'm surprised that those polls aren't actually higher than what they are. Mm. It's who you're actually polling and where you're polling. It looks to me as if they've been polling in the north of England. That's in their data. And that would suggest the red wall seat. So maybe this is a, shall we say, a wake up call to the mm. government to do something about Rwanda. OK, one of the lines that um, Rishi Sunak said to Christopher Hope today in our exclusive is Starmer doesn't have a plan. And in particular, on stopping the boats. Do you think we can trust Labour? I spoke to a Labour MP, again, sat in that very mm. seat earlier, who said the answer is closer alignment with Europe. That means the European Union. At the end of the day, Starmer hasn't got a plan, but Rishi Sunak has, and this is it. This is the Rwanda bill, and we're going to get this through tomorrow night. I'm very confident of that. And, you know, they'll see a party that's come together and not divided, 
And that in itself is something what the public will see tomorrow night and will stop those boats from coming across. OK, superb words. David Morris, MP for Morecambe and Luzo. I know you have to dash back to a vote. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. In our Westminster studio, Catherine Forster. Um, there we go. This will Thank get you. voted through. There won't be a rebellion. Um, pulling the cables out as you go there. Don't want to have the studio. Do you think that's going to be the case? Will this be another performative rebellion? But actually, they'll just row back and fall into line as usual. Well, we haven't got very long to wait. We've got uh, the debate going over two days, a whole series of amendments put forward by the five families on the right, also some the One Nation group on the left, and then individual votes on those amendments and then ultimately a vote on the bill as it ends up at the end of two days. If that bill was voted down, chaos would ensue, wouldn't yeah. it? I yeah. mean, it really would. So everybody talking very, very tough at the moment, but we saw that before Christmas. Will the people on the right of the party really follow through when it comes to the third reading? I don't know, but certainly there's about 60 right wing MPs in the party, um, very unhappy, some very high prominent ones. Former Home Secretary Suella Bravman told our political editor Chris Hope mm -hmm. last Friday she wouldn't support the bill as it stands. Lee Anderson, um, Deputy Chairman, yes. saying he can't support the bill. Um, Robert Jenrick, the same. So I think it is incredibly difficult for Rishi Sunak. I think all he can hope for is at the end of the day they'll realise there's a general election around the corner. If this bill doesn't go through, then they have nothing. They don't really have time to get something else together, to get it through, to get flights off. He will hope, think the best hope is that they fall in line behind this bill and that they do get flights off to Rwanda. Of course, we don't know if it will work and we don't know if anybody will have gone to Rwanda by the next election. And indeed, and. And Catherine, at six o'clock this evening, the 1922 committee are meeting. Andrea Jenkins, um, no fan of Rishi Sunak, of course, um, reposted her letter of no confidence in Rishi, urging others to follow suit. But this feels to me like Rishi does seem to now to have a grip on this rebellion. The numbers aren't enough to go through. We saw mass abstentions last time around, surely. Surely the Conservatives won't vote against their own Prime Minister and risk triggering a no-confidence a leadership challenge. That would be, that'd be suicide. You would think. You would think. I mean, Andrea Jenkins, of course, a passionate supporter of Boris Johnson, still blames uh, Rishi Sunak for his downfall. But, yes, at 6 o'clock, uh, the 1922 Committee of Backbench MPs meeting Isaac Levido. He, of course, is the election guru, the mastermind who helped lead them to that 80-seat majority in 2019. Now, he has said again and again and again, you only have a tiny window mm. towards victory, and that relies on a united party. People do not vote for divided parties, but I'm afraid to say at the moment the Conservative Party is washing its dirty linen very publicly, isn't it? So, um, yeah, they don't seem too united at the moment. I know we keep hearing they're united about the desire to stop the boats. No doubt they are, but they are totally disunited about how on earth they're going to get there. Superb. Catherine Forster, excellent as ever. The Tories are revolting. You get lots more on that story, of course, on our website. And thanks to you, gbnews.com. It's the fastest growing national news website in the country. It's got breaking news and all the brilliant analysis you've come to expect from GB News. So thank you very much for that. Now, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak tells the House of Commons Houthi rebels threats the commercial shipping in the Red Sea must stop. Speaking to MPs, he insisted the UK and US military's joint strikes last Thursday were the last resort. It was a necessary and proportionate response to a direct threat to UK vessels and therefore to the UK itself. And Mr Speaker, let me be absolutely clear why the Royal Navy is in the Red Sea. They are there as part of Operation Prosperity Guardian protecting freedom of navigation as a fundamental tenet of international law. The Houthis' attack on international shipping have put innocent lives at risk. They have held one crew hostage for almost two months, and they are causing growing economic disruption. 
And this comes as the U.S. military confirms the Iranian-backed Houthis launched three missiles, with one hitting a U.S.-owned ship in the Gulf of Aden near Yemen. And join me now to discuss this, GB News' home and security editor, Mark White. So, Mark, Rishi Sunak defiantly saying all 13 Houthi, Houthi targets were destroyed. This was in self-defense, necessary and proportionate. But, Mark, a lot of people watching the latest news were feeling that once again, Britain is being dragged inexorably into a war in the Middle East. Well, not if you listen to Rishi Sunak. He's talking about this being limited and necessary action. But, of course... Now we have this response from the Houthi rebels as they threatened uh, to carry out more strikes. Uh, we're seeing that in action with this latest strike on a US-owned container ship. This um, bulk carrier, the Gibraltar Eagle, uh, was heading along the Gulf of Aden, about 95 nautical miles southeast of the Yemeni port of Aden, when it was struck by a ballistic missile. Three missiles, according to the US Central Command, were fired towards this ship. Two landed short. One struck the ship on the port side. It caused damage and a fire in the cargo hold. That has since been contained. According to the ship's owners, uh, there was not significant damage and no injuries to the crew. Um, the latest uh, information we can see on uh, maritime tracking um, apps show that this container ship appears to have turned around, is heading away from the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea and heading back towards the Indian Ocean. Uh, no details on where it might be headed at this time, but clearly some significant concern because this follows another incident, Martin, yesterday in which a missile was fired this time at a US warship, an Arleigh Black Burke destroyer, part of the uh, carrier uh, strike group for the USS Eisenhower out in the region. It responded by firing off its own missiles and taking down uh, that Houthi rebel missile. Uh, but that will bring about a response. I think there's no doubt about that. And we, this afternoon, heard about an explosion in the Yemeni western port city of Hadeda. Uh, no more information other than an explosion was heard near the airport. No word from the US or, indeed, UK military sources as to whether there have been any involvement, they have been involved uh, in any way in what has happened uh, in Yemen this afternoon. But a very worrying state of affairs as we wait to see, one, what the rebels do next, but, of course, what the US and the UK do in response. OK, Mark White, thank you for that update. Rishi Sunak maintaining there's nothing to do with the Israel-Gaza conflict, but you can bet your bottom dollar that won't be how the Houthi rebels are spinning that in Yemen. Now, coming up, how that growing tension in the Middle East might hit the UK economy and the cost of goods here. I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, we're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. 
Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus-tested, pre-prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Welcome back, it's 5.26. You're watching or listening to Martin Daubney on GB News. Now, I've been covering reports that a US vessel near Yemen has been hit by a missile strike, raising the levels of tension in the Middle East. So what impact could the geopolitics and disruption to global trade and subsequent military intervention have on the UK's economy? Well, GB News' economics and business editor Liam Halligan joins me now with On The Money. Liam, always a pleasure. You put it so eloquently on Friday when you said everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Is the Mike escalating Tyson. situation in the Red Sea <laughs> the punch in the face Rishi Sunak's economy is getting? Yeah, that was Mike Tyson's phrase, wasn't it? The One of the best-known and most ferocious heavyweight boxing champions of the world ever. He once bit off an opponent's ear, but a really good boxer uh, uh, as well. Look, what's going on here? What's going on is that we have these attacks in the Red Sea. The Red Sea is the gateway from the Middle East to Europe via the Suez Canal. It's a 10% of the world's oil comes through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal every single day. We've also had attacks last week, the hijacking of an oil tanker in the Straits of Hormuz, even more alarming in terms of global energy markets because the Straits of Hormuz, into and out of the Persian Gulf, where so much oil and gas derives from. That's the Straits of Hormuz there on our screen. That's 25% of the world's oil every day. That is the global pinch point of the economy. That is literally the windpipe of world commerce right there. And if you can't get oil tankers through there every day easily, then the global economy will quite literally come to a halt. Rishi Sunak knows all this. The Americans know all this. That's why... America and the UK and other powers are working so hard to try and take out those Iranian-backed Houthi rebels' drones, which are attacking shipping. And this is having a real impact, uh, potentially, on British politics. So far, so far, we haven't seen a huge spike in the global oil and gas price. Oil's gone up from about $70-odd a barrel to around $80-odd a barrel. Since the beginning of the year since we had an escalation in these attacks. 
but it could get a lot worse. And already, a lot of freight shipping companies, they're not using the Straits, they're not using the Suez Canal, they're not using the Red Sea because of those drone attacks. And there's also nervousness now about ensuring tankers going through the Straits of Hormuz. That's why freight shipping costs have almost doubled in the last few weeks, and that will be impacted on inflation and the cost of living crisis. So this isn't just about the UK and the US asserting themselves on the global stage. It is literally about the Western world's ability to shake off this cost of living crisis and therefore, in the British context, the extent to which Rishi Sunak can even hope to challenge Labour at the next general election. Again, this big oil price spike hasn't happened yet. A big gas price spike ha hasn't happened yet because of this geopolitical turmoil. We have seen some chunky increases, so far manageable, and we've also seen a big increase in freight shipping costs. All this means that when the inflation number comes out uh, in, on Wednesday, the inflation number for December, that, of course, won't reflect these latest attacks, but it won't be as low as it otherwise would have been because we had some of these attacks, didn't we, before Christmas. I think the inflation number will be something like 3.8 or 3.9% where it currently is, much, much down from where it was double digits at the end of 2022. But I don't see the Bank of England, with these ongoing inflationary dangers, lowering interest rates in the next month or two. I think the first cut in interest rates will be more like April or May. Lim Hagan, expert analysis as ever, always on the money. Thanks for joining us on the show. Now, lots more still to come between now and six o'clock, and I'll be joined by Nigel Farage. Farage at large, of course. He's in Iowa to report on the Republican race for the White House as Donald Trump leads the polls to run for president. And very dapper, Nigel was looking to last night. Got compliments from Trump himself. But first is your latest news headlines with Polly Middlehurst. The top stories this hour, Rishi Sunak says the UK will back its words with actions in the Red Sea after the latest attack on a container ship southeast of Yemen's port of Aden. It follows a confirmed missile strike on a US-owned vessel causing a fire in the cargo hold, although there were no injuries. It's the second attack since the US-UK joint strikes on Houthi targets last week. And the militant group have vowed to continue their attacks despite international condemnation. Here, the Prime Minister has been saying the situation in Yemen won't stop the UK's support for other crises around the world. The threats to shipping must cease. Illegally detained vessels and crews must be released, and we remain prepared to back our words with actions. But, Mr Speaker, dealing with this threat does not detract from our other international commitments. Rather, it strengthens our determination to uphold fundamental UN principles. If our adversaries think that they can distract us from helping Ukraine by threatening international security elsewhere, they could not be more wrong. Rishi Sunak. Well, Sakir Starmer says he understands the risk to UK security but warned against escalating any trouble in the region. Military interventions by the UK government, particularly if they're part of a sustained campaign, should be brought before this House. <laughs> Scrutiny is not the enemy of strategy. Because while we back the action taken last week, these strikes still do bring risk. We must avoid escalation across the Middle East. Keir Starmer. Well, in other news today, a charity is saying parents are experiencing chaos as they try to access a new government scheme that's meant to provide 15 hours of free childcare. A survey of more than 6,000 parents across England found that just 11% were able to access a code which allowed them to claim their entitlement. A spokesperson for the government said the childcare application system is working as intended. And some chilly days ahead. Cold air is blowing in from the Arctic. It's going to bring with it snow and ice to most parts of the country. The National Highways Agency says a severe weather alert for snow will affect northwest and it's advising people to stick to main roads for travel. The Met Office is warning temperatures are going to be about six degrees lower than usual for this time of year. Snow and ice warnings also in place until tomorrow across Northern Ireland, Scotland and East Anglia. Those are the headlines. More detail on all those stories by heading to our website, 
gbnews.com. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Final look for you at today's markets. The pound buying you $1.2732 and €1.1627. The price of gold is £1,613.60 an ounce. And the FTSE 100 has closed the day today at 7,594 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Thank you, Polly. Now, after months of campaigning, the Republican U.S. presidential candidates will be battling for votes at the Iowa caucus this evening. It comes nine months ahead of the election and things are looking positive for former President Donald Trump, who maintains a huge lead over his Republican rivals. Our very own Nigel Farage is in Iowa. So let's take a look. We can also do Is that Nigel Farage, by the way? Oh, you stand up, will you? I'm just looking, looking at this handsome... This handsome guy, he's been a backer of mine from day one. I think called Brexit, very non-controversial. And you've been right, they haven't implemented too well, but you've been right. No, we're big fans. Thank you, Nigel. It's really an honor to have you here. Great. You look great. I love these suits. You know, they know how to dress over there. We don't know how to dress like they do. Thank you. Great honor, man. Nikki Haley even supported Rhino Paul Ryan's Great stuff. And the man himself joins us now live from Iowa. Good afternoon, Nigel. Absolutely showered with compliments there <laughs> by Donald Trump in that splendid chalk stripe suit. Nigel, what's the mood like within the Trump camp? They seem like they're on top of the world. Yeah, they're pretty bullish. Uh, they really are. Um, if the polls are right, that he's going to win this caucus this evening and win it by quite a big margin. Um, but I'm, I, I have to say, Martin, I mean, to be here, and to see the enthusiasm for the democratic process in America, I mean, it's such a contrast to our country. It really is remarkable that all these people will turn out at 7 o'clock tonight to vote, and some will vote for Trump, and some will vote for Haley or Ramaswamy, uh, but it really is an exciting thing to be part of. Yeah, Trump's going to win, probably by a big margin. And that's in stark contrast, of course, to Rishi Sunak back here in Blighty, Nigel, all over the front pages for the wrong reasons, including that poll facing a 1997-style electoral wipeout, even worse than Major suffered at the hands of Tony Blair. Do you think that's what will happen, and do they deserve it? Well, I've thought for a long time, and I've, I've written and, and spoken for over the course of the last year, that I don't think the Conservative Party have any idea what is about to come down the track towards them. And yes, they thoroughly deserve it. They've lied to us. They've betrayed much of what Brexit was about. They have been truly, truly awful. And I find this whole narrative in The Telegraph and elsewhere, oh, well, reform mustn't stand because, you know, the Conservatives might still have a chance you know, they don't have a God-given right. The Conservative Party does not have a God-given right to your vote. Um, and I, I have to say, the way the newspapers are behaving over this, I find quite bizarre. The Tories are so awful. They're so far away from the centre ground of opinion of most Conservative people that actually the right thing would be for them to be replaced. And, Nigel, what's interesting, this time around, you know, ABC, anyone but Corbyn in 2019, the mood amongst Conservative commentators doesn't seem to be that at all this time. They actually believe the Tories deserve to have this forest fire. Yeah, they do. They do, they do. You can't go on just lying in manifesto after manifesto. And, of course, the big one is immigration. Not even illegal immigration, but legal immigration. Since 2010... In manifesto of one after another, they promised net migration of tens of thousands a year. And the last figure we saw was nearly three quarters of a million. And you know what? They said it because they thought people wanted to hear it. They never actually meant it. So, yep, they deserve everything that is coming to them. And, of course, Nigel, people are getting very excited about the prospect of you dusting off your old tin hat and getting back onto the front lines. Yeah. Clacton mentioned, I saw you rolled your eyes a bit there. These rumours follow you everywhere, Nigel, but there is a huge interest. 
Well, there's certainly huge interest, Martin, of course. Um, but it's, it, it's, almost as if, it's almost as if people are trying to force me back mm. into it. Um, I think many elements of the media want me back in because it would be a good story. And frankly, because many of the other main players are pretty dull and pretty boring. Um, I repeat, I haven't decided what I'm going to do. OK, Nigel and Farage at large, live from Iowa tonight, 7 till 8 p.m. Promise to be a fantastic show. What yeah. do you got ahead for us? Yeah, we're going to have uh, we're going to have Eric Trump on the program. Uh, we're going to have Carrie Lake on the program. Uh, but also, of course, we'll look at what's happening. Uh, the statement today by Sunak, the attack on the Houthis, and the fact that the French aren't taking part in this at all. Got to ask yourself whether they're really, truly allies of ours. Superb stuff, Nigel Farage. Thanks for joining us on the Martin Dorman Show. Live from Iowa, 7 till 8 p.m. tonight, Farage at Lige. Lige going to be a corker. And that transatlantic bromance shows no signs of waning, does it? Talking a bit, of which here's Michelle Dubry joining me now on the show. But before, before Nigel Farage tonight, of course, it is Jubes and Go, 6 till 7 p.m. Here she is, my favourite uh, part of the show, even after Nigel Farage. Though. What's on your menu tonight, Jubes? Uh, never mind my menu. I noticed your little slip up there. That did not get past me, young man. And we should be having words about that in a second. I can tell you that once we've finished on air. Uh, anyway, coming up on my show tonight, of course, I want to look at this grooming gang situation. You know, do not be under any illusions, people. This is not a historical event. Um, I can tell you now, this stuff goes on in the here and now, in present day. How on earth do you get to uh, the bottom of it and stop it all then? Also, of course, I want to talk about NATO. Grant Shapps saying that people need to spend more money. Well, that's uh, fascinating. Fascinating, but actually, there's only about seven of the countries in NATO even managed to reach their current 2% target as it stands. So why is it always us putting our hands in our pockets to bail those people out when they can't even be bothered to meet their own spending targets? I also, as well, Martin, right, a trillionaire. Do you know how many zeros are in a trillion? I don't. Is it a thousand? No, there's 12 zeros in a trillion, right? And Oxfam reckon um, that actually within the next 10 years, we're going to see our first trillionaire. Is that a problem? Some people are saying it's a moral outrage. You should never be allowed to get that rich. That's what someone on my panel says. The other panellist, Alex Dean, says, why not? What's the problem in that? It's got to say, I agree with him. Yeah, well, a lot of people get very rich as well working for Oxfam, of course. Oh. Michelle Jubey, Jubes and Co. Six till a lot seven. Of get always a lot of other going to be a stuff corker. working for Oxfam as well, but I won't mention that. <laughs> there it goes. Jubes and Co. Six till seven, and that is the warm up for the Farage show live from Iowa tonight. A corking couple of hours ahead. Now coming up, Gary Lineker. Yes, him again has caused yet another headache for the BBC. Something of a habit. I'll be discussing his recent tweet about wanting to ban Israel from international football. Is it time to show old big ears the red card? I'm Martin Daubney on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News is Britain's news channel, and now you can support it. All you have to do is scan that QR code that's up on your screen right now, or you can go to gbnews.com forward slash support and become a GB News member. You'll have fantastic benefits. We're also going to organise special events where you as GB News members can meet the presenters, the on-screen faces. Scan the QR code or go to gbnews.com slash support. Thank you so much. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Open your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. It reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. Headliners every morning at 5 a.m. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Have a great Saturday night with me, Leo Curse, on this Saturday Night Showdown. It's a crazy world out there, so come and make fun of it with me, my panel of comedians, and a couple of people who actually know what they're talking about. This Saturday Night Showdown is your front row ticket to the clown show. Every Saturday, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to 5.45. Now the Sussexes have come into fire once again as a senior palace source shares the late Queen was as angry as I've ever seen her. And this comes as the Sussexes revealed the monarch had given her blessing for the naming of their daughter Lilibet, which of course was the Queen's childhood sacred nickname. So did Harry and Meghan cause the Queen distress in her final years over the naming of their daughter? Well, let's speak now to the man who knows the answer to that, our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Cameron, here we go again. This time, the anger of the late Queen. This would cause huge concern to our viewers um, that this even happened at all over the sacred nickname Lilibet. Yeah, Martin, I think this is another example of recollections may vary. It was incredibly rare for the late Queen to show any emotion in public, let alone be incredibly angry, which is what Robert Hardman, the author of this new book, seems to be alleging uh, in this book. Now, he is a guy who is incredibly plugged in to the royal household. He has spoken to members of the royal family, as well as staff, both past and present. He also produced that documentary that aired on Boxing Day of all the behind-the-scenes of the coronation. So that's just how plugged in he is. Now, this is all about Princess Lilibet's uh, name. So when Harry and Meghan announced their new baby's name in uh, 2021, of course, as if you just said, it was a, a nickname used by the late Queen's closest family and friends. Uh, they reported, uh, they said that it w they had the Queen's blessing. But a source, a palace source, told the BBC at the time that the Queen was not asked by Harry and Meghan if, they, if she gave their permission, uh, her permission even to use that name. Now, Sussex lawyers then fired back to all British uh, broadcasters and indeed newspapers, basically saying that that claim was false and defamatory. A spokesperson for Harry further went on to say that the Duke spoke to his grandmother in advance and would not have used the name of the monarch if Queen Elizabeth had not been supportive. Uh, and even, it's alleged in this new book, they then tried to get Buckingham Palace to get on side with one another. Uh, so they were all telling the same story, that the Queen has given her blessing. But Buckingham Palace, apparently, according to Robert Hardman, rebuffed that. So it does appear, again, recollections may vary. And it's the claim by the Sussex spokesperson which made the Queen quite so angry. And in fact, an aide told Robert Hardman that she had never, he, he had, they had never seen Queen Elizabeth II quite so angry. So we're getting some staggering claims out of this new book, which is released on Thursday, Charles III, New King, New Court. And in the last hour, we have had yet another extract published from the book, which is being serialised in the newspaper here uh, in the UK, where it reveals the new 
Queen's nickname, uh, Queen Camilla. Her nickname is Lorraine, a play on words um, of Lorraine, which is the French for the Queen. OK, Cameron Walker, thanks for an update on yet another right royal mess involving the Sussexes. And talking about right royal mess, here's another one. Because Gary Lineker has stuck his foot in the wrong place again. The controversial matter that a presenter is causing the BBC yet another headache after he reposted a statement from a pro-Palestine group on the social media site X, of course, formerly known as Twitter. The post called for Israel to be banned from international football because of what the group called via violations of international law committed in the Gaza conflict. Well, joining me now to discuss this is the former BBC presenter, broadcaster Danny Kelly, great friend of the show. Danny, once again, old Big Ears has put his foot in it. Is it time to put a sock in it? I, I think, Martin, for the future of the BBC, you and I disagree about whether the BBC should have a future in its current funding model. I believe it should do. And I worry about the 18,000 people who work for the BBC, most of whom will probably agree with Gary Lineker's point of view on uh, geopolitics and left-wing socialism. But nevertheless, they are reliant on the, the future of the licence fee. And Lineker is doing more to single-handedly defund the BBC than any defund the BBC organisation. And this is coming from an Everton fan who absolutely adores the ground that he walks on. I don't want to see the licence fee defunded, but I think he needs to stop thinking about his political activism and start thinking about his colleagues at the BBC. He is the poster boy, Martin, for defund the BBC. And if, if ever you wondered where his positioning was in this Gaza uh, Israel tragedy, well, it's no longer ambiguous. It, it's firmly anti-Israel. And he's making a mockery of the BBC. And if, if I was if I was in charge of the BBC, I, I would I would I would pay him off. I'd, I'd get rid of him out of this current contract because he's just incorrigible. He, he won't listen. He's just he's, his activism is more important than anything else. And I think that's a conflict of interest now. It's such a blatant conflict of interest, Martin. And Danny, um, very critical um, of our position in the Gaza conflict, but very quiet on his own position in taking the oil money from Qatar, not famed for their human rights, of course. No, of course, the double standards, it, it stinks, Martin. And if he wants to start having a pop at countries with links to terrorism and football, then he should start with Iran. Iran is a hotbed insidious hotbed inextricably linked to worldwide terror yet mr lineker keeps his mouth shut about iran and the iranian football team uh the double standards it, it's gobsmackingly obvious martin and yeah i think he's on borrowed time i wonder though martin whether he he understands that this is his last season at match of the day maybe and he's going out he's falling on his sword and he's going out as this left-wing martyr i don't know it'll be interesting to see how it plays out OK, Danny Kelly, thank you. Always a pleasure. Never a chore. Now then, moving on swiftly at 9pm, of course, we have Patrick Christie tonight. Patrick, I know you've got a superb exclusive in store for us tonight. Look, Martin, thank you very much. I am back with a bang, 9 to 11 p.m. tonight, and we've got an interview with former Immigration Minister Robert Jemrick. It's his first proper sit-down that he's done since he resigned over Rishi Sunak's version of the Rwanda plan. He also tees off on legal immigration. I've got a little flavour for you of what we're going to be playing out on our show. The pace of change, with such a large number of people coming in each year, is so great. It's putting real strain on communities and on the kind of well-integrated, united country that I want to see. There is no way that we can fix the housing crisis without solving this immigration question. The housing crisis is increasingly an immigration crisis. And my advice to the Prime Minister is you will not succeed unless you adopt this very robust mm. approach, and then we will let the public down. Massive prom problems with the rate of demographic change. He also goes on to say that he doesn't think Rishi Sunak really can win the Rwanda uh, bill and get re-elected as it currently stands. There's a heck of a lot in this interview. He does not hold back. We'll be playing that out 9 to 11 p.m. tonight on Patrick Christie's Tonight, Martin. Superb, and Pat, we've got a quick minute left. What else have you got on your menu for us tonight? 
Well, we're going to be talking about the grooming gang issue, which has not gone away. We have seen that predominantly British South Asian men have been able to act with impunity when it comes to, again, predominantly working-class, young, vulnerable white girls. I've got Maggie Oliver on, who led the charge at Greater Manchester Police to try to uh, stop this taking place. Sadly, it is still happening. I will not be holding back uh, on all of that, so make sure that you tune in uh, there. And I'm going to be asking as well, with all these wars going on abroad and our involvement in them, is it time to actually put Brits first? We can't control the channel, but we want to control the Red Sea. We can't fix potholes, but we want to fix the Middle East. So I'm going to be getting stuck right into that. Superb stuff. Patrick Rissi tonight. Superb show Thank coming you. up. And it was great to see you in the studio earlier because Pat did his interview right here with Robert Jenrick. I spoke to Robert on his way out. Um, he's determined, I think, to be a part of this rebellion this week in Parliament. Will it be enough to sink Sunak? It's going to be a tumultuous week ahead for the Prime Minister. We know that they're gathering. In fact, in about seven minutes' time, the 1922 committee is meeting. There are some people out there, Andrew Jenkins included, who would like to see a leadership challenge kick in. But is that absolute bedlam, suicide for the Conservative Party? One thing we do know is that the fate of the Tory party will be decided at the next election. That starts right today. Will this revolt get through? Will Sunak get through the 1922 committee meeting unscathed? A huge, huge week ahead in British politics. And as usual, we're covering it all right here on The Morning Dorming Show. Three till six. Up next, Tubes & Co, six till seven. And after that, Farage at Large, live from Iowa in the USA. Fantastic. Have a great evening. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Very good evening to you. I'm Alex Burkill here with your latest GB News weather forecast. The cold theme set to continue and so it will stay frosty and icy at times with some snow showers too. But there is also the potential for some heavy persistent snow across northern parts as we go into Tuesday in association with a weather system currently towards the northwest of the UK. However, as we go through this evening and overnight, it's going to be cold. It's going to be frosty. We will see further snow showers feeding down on a brisk northerly wind, so particularly across northern Scotland and anywhere exposed to that northerly wind, that's where we're most likely to see the snow showers. Elsewhere, further inland, largely dry with some clear skies, and under the clear skies, a widespread frost, coldest across parts of Scotland, could get into negative double figures. As we go through Tuesday then, for much of England and Wales, and actually a largely fine day, again some winter sunshine around, but further north, the potential for some persistent snow to push in across parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, and particularly across Scotland, could see more than uh, 10 centimetres of snow perhaps, and so that could cause some significant disruption. Again, it is going to be a cold day, temperatures a little bit below average for the time of year. As we look towards Wednesday, and there is a feature towards the south of the UK, currently likely just to stay to the south of us, but the potential it could bring a bit of significant snow to southern parts of the UK. Further north, looking largely dry, plenty of winter sunshine again, but some snow showers for far northern parts, perhaps. Later on in the week, likely to turn dry and temperatures lifting a little bit too. Bye-bye. That warm feeling in 